November 26, 2014. A plot of federal land in the Midwestern United States appears to be completely uninhabited. But to those in the know, this is actually the location of Biological Research Area 12, a large SCP Foundation facility that houses and experiments on live biological entities and hazardous tissue samples. Already, it was proving to be a challenging day for the personnel stationed at Area 12, due to what seemed like a freak technical glitch. They were dealing with a system failure and a large-scale containment breach. The deadly bladed petals of SCP-143 were drifting through the air. The acidic SCP-153 roundworms were breeding. SCP-811 was running wild, and a number of amnesia-inducing SCP-939 creatures had escaped their pen. In short, it was a total disaster. Complete paranormal pandemonium. And things were about to get so much worse as the sounds of whirring helicopter blades and the rumbling engines of heavy military vehicles approached. The embattled staff were relieved that Mobile Task Force reinforcements were arriving so quickly. After all, Area 12 was relatively isolated, and they'd only just put in a call for help. On-site security staff were being overwhelmed in the chaos of the containment breach, and they needed the big guns if they wanted to get things under control before it was too late. What they didn't know as the vehicles surrounded their facilities is that it was already far too late for most of them. Soon, heavily armed troops and protective tactical gear were storming the facility. As they entered, terrified staff members ran towards them for protection and then stopped in their tracks. These soldiers didn't bear the insignia of the SCP Foundation or any known mobile task force, nor did they bear the symbols of the Global Occult Coalition. This was something different altogether. Some of the Foundation personnel began to beg for assistance anyway, seeing it as an any port in the storm situation. They realized too late that this group wasn't here to save them, and met their end in a hail of bullets from the soldiers' assault rifles. When the actual mobile task force finally did arrive, they witnessed a horrifying sight. Most of the on-site Foundation personnel had been shot dead, and there were no trace of the culprits. Even worse, several of the SCP-939 creatures were missing, these are the predatory pack-hunting creatures that produce amnestic chemicals to lure and disorient their prey. These anomalies are dangerous enough on their own, but in the hands of someone who really knew how to use them, these living amnestic factories could pose an extremely serious threat. The Mobile Task Force members knew what they were dealing with here. Only one group would have the nerve to perform a high-casualty heist on an SCP Foundation oh. facility during a containment breach. The Chaos Insurgency. The Mobile Task Force reported the incident back to command and already knew what their next mission would be. Track down the insurgency splinter cell and get the 939s back. This mission would have the absolute highest stakes, and if they weren't successful, there was no limit to the damage the Chaos Insurgency could do with a creature as dangerous as SCP-939 under their control. But who exactly are the Chaos Insurgency? What do they want? And why are they stealing anomalies? The Chaos Insurgency is one of the most mysterious and clandestine of the groups that fight against the SCP Foundation. They are different from the Global Occult Coalition, a United Nations offshoot created after the Seventh Occult War, whose mission is to destroy rather than try to contain anomalies. The Serpent's Hand is on the opposite end of the spectrum. This group strives for the normalization of the anomalous and the destruction of the webs of secrecy that keep the anomalous and consensus reality separate. Both the GOC and the Serpent's Hand have clear ideals and mission statements, but the Chaos Insurgency is less forthcoming about their beliefs and convictions. Something we know for sure about the Chaos Insurgency, though, is that they view anomalies as tools to be utilized rather than unpredictable elements to be contained, studied, or neutralized. To this end, they do whatever it takes to obtain more anomalies of their own. Whether it's ruthlessly seeking out anomalies in the wild, or taking them from the Foundation with coordinated strikes during moments of weakness. Though they lack the support and resources of organizations like the Foundation and the GOC, the Chaos Insurgency more than makes up for it in devotion to their cause, their unpredictability, and most of all, their willingness to use violence. It's difficult to separate the facts from the rumors when it comes to the Chaos Insurgency. Some believe that, to compensate for their rejection by the United Nations as an official group dealing with anomalous incidents, they instead receive support from certain dictatorships in the developing world. 
Funded by the blood money of various warlords, they carry out their research on political prisoners and captured refugees provided by their murderous allies. They're also believed to illegally deal both weapons and intelligence, helping the dictators who fund them remain in power and subjugate their own people. The Foundation has been able to gather some intel about the Chaos Insurgency's organizational structure, which looks like a strange mirror of their own. It's led by the mysterious Delta Command, headed by a figure known only as the Engineer. Gamma-class personnel execute the orders of Delta Command using the lesser Beta-class personnel as field operators. And finally, there is Alpha-class. They're typically forced into conscription from the states occupied by the insurgency and serve as cannon fodder for the group as they track down as many anomalies as they can. And the insurgency is believed to possess a number of powerful anomalies already. These include the Bell of Entropy, an object that can cause a variety of destructive effects depending on where it is struck, and the Staff of Hermes, an anomalous object capable of warping the physical and chemical properties of any matter it touches. The Chaos Insurgency is only growing more powerful as they continue their pursuit of money and power with a legion of militarized anomalies. Their goal? Total world domination. Other accounts are a little more charitable to the beliefs and causes of the Chaos Insurgency. They've been described as a rebellion against the ruthless early days of the SCP Foundation, when they had a more violent, take-no-prisoners attitude. This rumor has likely been disseminated by the Chaos Insurgency themselves, though, as it paints them in the most positive and righteous light. In reality, the truth, as is often the case, is somewhere in the middle. Danger often comes from within, and the Chaos Insurgency is no exception. One constant in all interpretations of the origin of the Chaos Insurgency is that its members are rogue elements of the SCP Foundation, and it's commonly believed that they have countless moles still deep in the organization today. However, one well-kept secret among the upper echelons of the Foundation is that the creation of the Chaos Insurgency is a lot less unknown than they'd like you to think. Yes, danger really does often come from within. When researching the origins of the Chaos Insurgency, you'll likely see two dates pop up again and again, 1924 and 1948. According to the official line from the SCP Foundation, 1924 was the date of the Chaos Insurgency's defection, and 1948 marked the first series of violent raids that the Chaos Insurgency led against the Foundation. But these are only half-truths. While both dates are indeed significant in the story of the Chaos Insurgency, it's for entirely different reasons. 1924 was the date when the Chaos Insurgency, known at the time simply as the Insurgency, was created by the O5 Council. Why would the SCP Foundation's commanding authority knowingly create one of the Foundation's enemies? Well, you have to understand that at the time, the Insurgency served a very different purpose. They were intended to be a black ops group for the O5 Council, capable of doing their dirty work off the books and out of sight of the rest of the Foundation, especially its Ethics Committee, which is often in conflict with O5 Command. Their members were recruited from Mobile Task Force Alpha-1, also known as the Red Right Hand, a highly secretive MTF in the pocket of the O5. For 24 years, they did the O5's dirty work while shielding the Foundation's international reputation from any potential fallout. They were faithful soldiers, until they found themselves a new master. The Engine, a mysterious anomalous object that began to invade and infect the minds of the insurgency. The group's human leader, the previously mentioned Engineer, is merely a puppet of the Engine, its human mouthpiece. While the full extent of the Engine's plans remains mysterious to even members of the Chaos Insurgency, the Engine has been passing down orders ever since. In 1948, the Insurgency fully defected, becoming the Chaos Insurgency, and they've been a problem for the SCP Foundation ever since. From raids, to assassinations, to threats of damaging the illusion of consensus reality with their reckless behavior. And now, thanks to their acquisition of SCP-939, they could get started on Amnestics production too. Thankfully for the Foundation, they had prepared for 939's getting out into the world and all of the creatures housed at Area 12 had been implanted with subdermal trackers. Several mobile task forces were immediately dispatched to home in on the signal, take out the insurgents, and secure the 939s once more. 
They tracked the signal to a warehouse in the Badlands of New Mexico, where task force members stormed in and began a tense firefight with the Chaos Insurgents, all Gamma and Beta class, of course. The Delta classes, just like O5s, are notoriously slippery. They emerge like tactical ghosts from behind boxes and exposed pipes, advancing and firing with no regard for their own lives and safety. Slaves to the engine. It wasn't like battling your run-of-the-mill cultists. These were highly organized and dangerous combatants, with training right out of the Foundation's mobile task force playbook. Several Foundation soldiers were lost in the crossfire, but ultimately, they won the day, subduing the Chaos Insurgency forces and capturing the stolen 939s once more. Several of the insurgents that had been fatally wounded in battle were found to be Area 12 personnel, double agents for the insurgency. Many of them died with smiles on their faces, knowing they were defying the Foundation to their last breath. There was no way of knowing just how many of these secretive Chaos Insurgents were undercover, deep in the fabric of the Foundation's global apparatus. A nearby Insurgent, slowly dying from several gunshot wounds, gave a wheezy laugh. As the task force operators approached, he ranted that the Foundation's obsession with order, lies, and secrecy is the real disease that chaos and entropy is the fate of all things, and that to use the anomalies they find for their own gain is simply common sense. In the world the chaos insurgency would someday create, human beings would be the true masters of the universe, not just the perpetrators of the twisted lie we call normality. He succumbed to his injuries shortly after, and the task forces refocused their efforts on getting the 939 safely back to Area 12. What these Chaos Insurgency troops really believed is an open question. After all, the power that dictates them, the anomalous engine, is a consciousness beyond humanity. Even the engineer doesn't know the true scope of their master's grand plan. If the rest of us are lucky, and the Chaos Insurgency never reaches their mysterious goals, then neither will we. Abel wandered through the sands, a lone warrior, dragging a long, dark sword behind him, his black cloak flowing in the gentle breeze. The sword was thirsty. It had been too long since it tasted blood. What had it been? A day since he cut down ten men in a tavern without breaking a sweat? They would bled and screamed like pigs as he diced them into bloody chunks. He couldn't remember their faces. They hadn't earned that. Very few combatants had been remarkable enough to warrant committing to memory. It was all just more dead flesh. He took a sip from his canteen and sighed. Did this world hold no more challenges? What a boring eternity was laying out before him. His burden as the greatest warrior of all time weighed on him heavier than the chain. It was old and rusty, levered over his shoulder and grasped in one bloody hand. About fifteen feet behind him, the chain was connected to a dark stone sarcophagus that was as much a part of him as his eyes, skin, or heart. If ever he was slain in the glorious heat of battle, he'd rise out of it, ready to fight and kill another day. All because of the actions of his worthless, good-for-nothing brother. He looked up when he heard the rush of footsteps and the clanking of armor. Warriors, or whatever passed for them around here, about twenty of them, circled all around him. Yes. Oh, yes. His grip tightened around his sword. One of the warriors called out something about him being under arrest by order of the king for murders beyond counting. Abel couldn't help but yawn. Words, words, words. Why even bother? He dropped the chain, and in one fluid motion, he threw his sword. In a fraction of a second, it pierced the armor of the chattering man, spearing him through his formerly beating heart. The scream died in his throat. He fell to his knees, then collapsed entirely. The other soldiers sent to kill or apprehend him turned to their fallen leader and gasped. It was that little gasp, that moment of distraction, that sealed their fates. Abel's face cracked into a whisper of a grin as he drew two long daggers from the darkness of his coat. He'd at least try to have fun with this. Before the others could even get over their leader's sudden death, Abel had vaulted forward and begun his delicate dance of slaughter. Every swing found its way through armor and into skin. He sliced throats, cleaved off heads, parried blows, and pierced hearts. There was barely a single scream. Abel killed too quick for screams. In what would seem like the blink of an eye for some, the soldiers around Abel fell. 
most dead, the rest dying. Some looked up to him in their dying moments, in terrified awe of the efficacy of their killer. In their dying moments, they knew that they never had a chance. They might as well have been facing the glistening scythe of death himself on the battlefield. Abel, on the other hand, rolled his eyes and sighed. Another pathetic waste of time. He sensed movement in the corner of his eye. One of the wounded soldiers was limping to his feet, trying to use the sword to lever himself off of the ground. With a flick of each wrist, Abel tossed his knives into the man, killing him instantly. It really was that easy. Your attempt to kill me does not offend me, he said to whoever was still able to hear. What offends me is that they would send so few, and that those few would be such pitiful excuses for soldiers. This wasn't a battle, it was a mercy killing. He was ready to turn around, grab the chain, and carry on walking when he felt a sudden pain in his back. There was a slight whistle, then another sharp spike of pain. There were now two arrows sticking out of his back. Abel turned surprised and saw a much larger force standing behind him. Swordsmen, archers, men with clubs and axes and chains. The ones he'd killed were little more than a distraction. This was the real threat. This was a real army. Perhaps these fools would give him some actual exercise. He reached into his cloak and pulled out a mighty obsidian battle axe. At the very least, he'd try to have a little fun turning this fighting force into cold cuts. A fog of arrows sailed through the air as he charged forwards, perforating his body, but the injuries didn't slow him down. He lunged, slashed, and cleaved. Even as the weapon struck him, he carried on killing person after person. At times, it was almost exciting, almost, but not quite. By the time he was done, none were left standing. Thirty arrows were sticking out of him. He had been cut deep by more weapons than he could count on his fingers and toes. He was breathing deeply, scarred chest pumping up and down. He coughed blood and cracked his neck back into place. They might have cut him a little too deep this time. No matter. Abel fell to his knees, feeling the life draining from him. He wondered when he awoke from the coffin again what the world would look like. Sometimes it was days, sometimes weeks, months, or even years. As he fell forward dying once again, he'd hoped that he'd wake into a world with a warrior or beast that could actually challenge him. Maybe someday. This was one of Abel's many lives, hundreds of years before he was contained by the SCP Foundation. He's perhaps the greatest warrior who ever lived, died, and lived again. He's a man so individually deadly that not only is he kept in a containment chamber under the sea, surrounded by highly trained and armored guards, he has his own localized on-site nuclear weapon, ready to blow away and annihilate him and his entire containment area if deemed necessary. He may not be a contagious anomalous pathogen or a lethal mimetic hazard, or a giant beast shooting world-destroying fireballs in every direction, but if this one-man massacre was left to his own devices, there's no doubt that he would methodically slaughter his way through the human race until an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario was practically inevitable. He was fueled by pure hatred and an almost bottomless bloodlust. He simply lived to fight and kill. And not only did he have the will and the skill to be a pure force of annihilation, but his anomalous abilities also make him perfectly tailored to the task. He has massively enhanced physical strength, speed, and durability, taking the kind of damage that would kill several normal humans to reliably put him down. Though even that is only a temporary measure. Abel will always resurrect back into his black sarcophagus to menace the SCP Foundation another day. It is also effectively impossible to disarm Abel because he has the anomalous ability to pull deadly edged weapons from localized pocket dimensions at will, and his proficiency with these weapons is unlike any warrior the world has ever known, before or since. During containment breaches, he's regularly killed scores of trained Foundation guards, with both numerical advantages and considerably more advanced ranged weapons. Despite being a simple humanoid, he was taking up a truly insane amount of containment resources. Despite his violent tendencies, Abel is still a recognizable sentient human, albeit an extremely deadly anomalous one. This led some higher-ups at the Foundation to come up with an interesting idea. What if Abel's eternal rage could be harnessed? What if they could use their resources to reshape this rampaging killer into a devoted sword of the Foundation's cause? After all, 
If he wanted worthy opponents, what could be more worthy than the anomalous monsters that the Foundation faced on a daily basis? And as long as they kept the sarcophagus, even if Abel was killed in the line of duty, he'd still be accounted for. In many ways, if he could be trained and truly brought to heal, there could be no better asset to their coming struggles. It was this logic, allowing anomalies to work for the SCP Foundation in exchange for benefits, that led to the creation of a new groundbreaking mobile task force, MTF Omega-7, Pandora's Box. This group became the SCP Foundation's Hail Mary Pass. For any particularly dangerous or potentially deadly missions, they could send in Abel along with a group of highly trained Foundation soldiers that even the ancient blade-wielding warrior held respect for. While like their namesake, Pandora's Box, it would all wind up in terrible tragedy. To begin with, they achieved some of the highest mission successful results of any mobile task force on the Foundation's payroll. No task was too challenging for them to swoop in and crush it. This was far from expected. Abel, one of the most violent SCPs they'd ever contained, suddenly became a great asset to their operations, a vital tool in their quest to keep the anomalous at bay. He cleaved through legions of Chaos Insurgency soldiers during breaches into their secure sites. He fought off well-paid, well-trained, and well-armed bodyguards of Marshall Carter and Dark Limited during Foundation raids on their clandestine operations. He'd even gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with some of the deadliest anomalies in containment during mass escapes. It was hard to imagine how they'd ever lived without him. Of course, while Abel was happier than he'd had been in years, in his element. In fact, as a working warrior giving varied missions and frequent opponents, there was still something nagging at him. His thoughts were hounded by his white whale. The endless search for a truly worthy opponent. Someone or something that could really give him a run for his money. After millennia of leaving opponents dead in this wake, nothing would bring him more joy than meeting someone that actually knocked him on his ass. A new bar somewhere above him to work towards. Oh, what a glorious day that would be. Eventually, the Foundation started to run into a problem. They were running out of missions to give Abel. After all, he wasn't the kind of operative you could just give any mission to. His potential for collateral damage was truly staggering. He'd neutralize the anomaly, then slaughter everyone within a hundred foot range just to work off some of the excess energy. Like a hand grenade, he was powerful, but dangerously imprecise. If they ran out of high priority missions, what were they supposed to do? Just put Abel back in his box to gather dust until someone else rolled around? He was getting antsy enough between missions already. That's when an unexpected member of personnel stepped forward, Dr. Jack Bright. You see, Dr. Bright and Abel had a history, and not an altogether pleasant one. Not that anyone could really have a pleasant history with Abel. Jack was only a junior researcher when he had his run-in, carrying a seemingly worthless medallion dubbed SCP-963 back to its containment locker. That's when a wall next to him exploded, showering him with brick fragments and dust only to reveal Abel standing behind the new aperture. Before young Dr. Bright even had a chance to scream, Abel had already cleaved through him, leaving him in two distinct parts that were both very much dead. At least, it seemed that way, until it was revealed that Dr. Bright's consciousness had actually been eternally bonded with SCP-963, giving him the gift and curse of immortality. Since then, Dr. Bright had become increasingly reckless in his conduct, perhaps hoping that the next time he fades to black, the movie that is his sad, strange life won't just start to roll again. Of course, he hasn't been lucky in that regard yet. Naturally, this has given Dr. Bright complex feelings about his fellow Anomalous Foundation employee. So when the call came around, all the senior researchers and site directors asking if there were any tasks that Abel seemed fit for, he had one very pressing suggestion. After all, it wasn't that long after Dr. Bright had been forced into a cross-test with the intention of terminating 682, which had not only been a failure, but a generally painful and exhausting experience. Now, perhaps it would be Abel's turn to take his lumps. He happily put forth a suggestion, claiming that surely the Foundation's new sword-wielding Golden Boy could give the hard-to-destroy reptile the old college try. After all, even if Abel was killed in the process, he'd just come right back. It was a situation where they really could not lose, so why not take a chance? 
What's the worst that could happen? The O5 Council found Dr. Bright's pitch extremely compelling. He succeeded in every mission they'd given him so far, so perhaps he could carry that success into the Herculean task of actually terminating 682. One boundlessly bloodthirsty killer might be the only thing truly capable of taking out another of equal magnitude. When Abel was informed of this latest mission, he got a scary glint in his eye. They gave him warning after warning. The beast is said to be unkillable. It can adapt to anything. It's killed scores of people and survived the attacks of anomalies thought to be flawless killers. The more it was explained to him, the more Abel felt the tingling sensation deep within. Was this it? Had he now discovered the perfect opponent? Something that would actually challenge him, would actually put him through his paces? Yes, yes, yes. He accepted the mission without question. Abel would fight SCP-682 until his breath was no longer. In order to prepare for the match, SCP-682 was released into a secure area, rocky desert-like terrain, boarded on all sides by a foundation perimeter, hundreds of meters away on all sides. They thought it best for the showdown to happen here. After all, with combatants like Abel and 682, it was bound to make a mess, one way or another. Abel strode with pronounced swagger onto the battleground shortly afterwards, carrying perhaps the most powerful sword he'd ever summoned. It was somewhere between a claymore and a chainsaw, an unholy union that gave the resulting weapon a degree of deranged badassery not ever seen on the battlefields of planet Earth before. Carrying this thing, Abel felt like a king, and he was about to slay the most ancient and bestial of monsters. As he approached 682 and took in the whole of it, he could feel his heart pounding with excitement in his chest. It was a huge reptilian nightmare. He could see its scales hardening into a mighty carapace as he approached. Its huge serrated fangs, its bulging sinewy muscles, and insane dagger-like claws. Oh yes, this would be the one. The beast snarled at him as he approached. He just smiled, puffed out his chest, and said, I have heard tales of creatures like you. Glorious beasts of scale and flesh, talon and fang. A prowess in battle even greater than the immense intellect hiding behind those bestial eyes. They said your kind once ruled the earth from enormous stockpiles of treasure killing and eating all who displeased you. But you were knocked from your throne one by one by the great warriors who walk this world no longer until they were no more and you became but a mere myth. Even I had thought you to be nothing but fairy tales. But yet, here you stand before me, a living dragon. In response to Abel's lofty speech, the monster merely grumbled and chided him, claiming he was little more than a pathetic SCP <laughs> Foundation lapdog, following orders and being manipulated. It showed no respect for Abel as a valued enemy combatant, merely another nuisance thrown at it in a futile attempt to finish its wretched and seemingly eternal life. Abel couldn't take such insolence. He leapt forwards, bringing down his mighty chainsaw claymore, ready to cleave the beast in two. However, what he didn't expect was the move SCP-682 pulled next, throwing its head up against the blade of Abel's sword, shredding away huge chunks of flesh and bone, and utterly confusing Abel in the process. For the first time in a lifetime of intense battles, Abel found himself thinking, what the hell am I up against here? The force of 682's headbutt threw Abel off balance, leaving his stomach briefly exposed, but briefly was all SCP-682 needed. It thundered its massive stony fist into Abel's gut, throwing him like a rag doll into a nearby rock with such a force that it nearly shattered the rock behind him. It was a force like he hadn't felt in years. He spat some bloody teeth and grinned. This was just what the doctor ordered. He issued a challenge to the beast in a long dead language as it seized violently, regenerating, growing, taking on the stony qualities of the ground around it. It looked like a vengeful living mountain, a true behemoth of a beast. In other words, challenge accepted. Abel pulled an obscenely giant mace from the shadows of his cloak, 
the handle six feet long with a chaos of swirling blades and spikes. A perfect weapon for slaying a dragon like this, he thought to himself. The two charged at each other, full of power and fury. Abel swung the mace once again, shattering the creature's head and flinging it back across the battlefield with the sheer force of its strike. The decimated lizard clawed its way into the ground, devouring the rocks and the earth, integrating more matter to fuel its regeneration. But it wasn't long before Abel was upon it again, striking mercilessly, giving blows as the monster gave brutal claw strikes in return. They were ripping each other's bodies apart, piece by piece, but Abel felt so exhilarated he could barely even notice. It was the fight of his life, a battle against a truly worthy opponent. This was heaven. Abel leaped into the air and unleashed a volley of deadly chakram down onto the beast, shredding into its reinforced flesh. As the force of gravity brought him down, he pulled a mighty axe from his cloak and bellowed a warrior's roar as he brought it down, splattering into the nightmarish body of SCP-682. However, this did nothing to even slow the beast down. It flipped over, slashing Abel with its claws. When Abel stumbled, it leaped on top of him, unleashing devastating slashes and punches onto the fallen warrior with the speed of a machine gun firing. When it raised its claw to deal with the killing blow, though, Abel once again turned the tables. He produced a giant pair of mechanical scissors from thin air and sliced off both of SCP-682's forelegs. The beast descended with its mighty jaws to devour Abel, but he kicked up with freakish strength behind his bladed boot. The sheer force of the kick flipped SCP-682 onto its back. Now it was Abel's turn to execute his opponent, though on some level he thought it would be an awful shame to lose such a terrific beast from this world of cardboard. Still, a battle is a battle, and this is how they go. He jumped onto 682 and went berserk, slashing into it relentlessly with blade after blade, pulling out a new one every time the old one broke down from his sheer ferocity. He screamed in incoherent battle fury, tearing, slicing, ripping, rending. Yes. Yes, yes, yes! As Abel stepped away to breathe, the beast began to regenerate, releasing a shockwave that started to warp reality around it. But Abel wouldn't have this. No, he would give this beast no quarter. It was time to present the true pain he was notorious for. He pulled a long sword from his cloak and charged, taking air and bringing it down towards SCP-682's head. The beast, sensing the warrior's presence, opened its mouth, unleashing a chasm of horrifying teeth within. The two were on a fierce collision course. As the jaws closed, Abel descended. Both roared in infinite rage and bloodlust. Both combatants fell to the ground, just twitching. Oh, what a glorious, terrible day it had been. Neither had died for good, but both would remember this incredible battle forever. When Abel awoke once more in his dark stone coffin, he did so with a smile. What a battle. What a fight. What a truly honorable pursuit. After so long being bored and unfulfilled, he found an opponent that got his blood pumping once more. His stomach grumbled. A post-battle feast was in order. Now where did they put that magic pizza box? Does the black moon howl? No, not yet. See the boy. He was born in a time before names. There weren't enough humans around to need them back then. He was one of a handful occupying a coastal village, using a tongue long since dead. They eked out a simple life, hunting, gathering, fishing. The only thing on most of their minds was surviving to see the next sunrise. Yes, a simple life, free of complications. Until the hermit appeared. The boy would remember this man for eternity, haggard and thin, skin weathered by time and pain. A man that, emaciated, walking with a long, gnarled cane that honestly looked healthier than he did, shouldn't be alive. Even the boy, who had scarcely seen beyond the bounds of his village, knew that the hermit was unnatural, an aberration, an anomaly. He walked into the center of the village, sat down on a large stone, and waited. Nobody dared ask his business, nor what the hermit waited for. Then, a few days later, the black moon howled. 
The boys saw the village's youngest hunter freeze one evening while out on a walk. Not simply stand still, but freeze. Then for an instant, he became solid black, a coal statue, and as soon as he'd changed, he was gone. Obliterated, not a trace of him remained. Such is the power of the Black Moon. It can make any conscious being disappear in an instant, turn black, then wiped from our plane of existence, never to be seen again. Its choice of victims seemed, at each instance, to be utterly random, but it would come for all who lived eventually. This is known to some as the Howling of the Black Moon. Later that same night, the boy found himself talking to the hermit, who asked with small, frantic eyes what he had seen. When the boy told him, he let out a deep, rattling sigh. The boy, curious, asked him if he knew about the nightmare he'd just witnessed. The hermit looked up. He'd been the first one in the hermit's millennia of pursuit that had ever asked. In that moment, he knew that he had found his successor in the hunt for the death of ages. The hermit told the boy it went by many names. The Great Finale, the Pale King, but most common of all was the Black Moon. The entity existed beyond the veil of our reality, a creature of pure energy, though nobody could really be sure of its true nature. The hermit had been tracking it, learning about it, and trying to destroy it for thousands of years. And yet it only took him four pathetic minutes to tell the boy everything he knew. The boy, knowing still that something about the hermit was unnatural, asked how he came to be in this position. The hermit told the boy he was the counterbalance, a kind of chosen one, destined to face and perhaps even defeat the Black Moon someday. The counterbalance receives a number of truly extraordinary gifts for inheriting the responsibility, eternal life, eternal youth, near physical immortality but they will be haunted by their purpose, doomed to watch everyone they love die around them, as they continue to hunt their only true equal and opposite, the Black Moon itself. The hermit in his own eyes had failed at his duty. He had grown weary, and now he needed to pass the duty of counterbalance on to another. That other would be the boy. He felt a sudden and profound change, along with the knowledge that nothing would ever be the same again. He was no longer just the boy. Now, he was the counterbalance. He watched the hermit give him a slight nod of respect and then crumble into dust before his eyes. The boy, the counterbalance, looked up at the sky and saw the stars twinkling, so bright and so beautiful. Little did he know his battle with the Black Moon would outlast every single one of them. Does the Black Moon howl? Not without blood. The boy grew into a man as his village aged and then died around him. Decades passed, then centuries, then millennia. Tens of thousands of years watching humanity develop and grow around him as he continued his pursuit of that one elusive foe. As science and diagnostic technology gained ground, absorbing and then evolving beyond all the old superstitions, the counterbalance gained a better understanding of the Black Moon, though even then, it still remained essentially a stranger. The entity was entropic, a being of pure randomness and chaos without consistent form. It didn't exist in our universe, but it could exercise its influence here with so-called obliteration events much like the horrible fate that befell the young hunter from the village. But that was only the proverbial tip of the iceberg. The counterbalance tracked and noted obliteration events. They were exceedingly rare at first, something that occurred once every thousand years or so, like a terrible curse. But he couldn't help but notice a concerning trend emerging. It started happening once a century, then once a decade. He could feel the terrible future stretching out in front of him, how, over their shared eternity, the Black Moon would gain more and more ground. Would there come a day where it took someone once a year, once a month, a week, a day, an hour, a minute, a second? It'd spell the end of all conscious life. A total victory for the Black Moon. The end of the universe. The death of ages. A complete existential obliteration. He was swept up in a sobering realization. 
he couldn't win this fight alone. However, while his hunt for the Black Moon had been largely fruitless, the counterbalance had discovered many other things along the way. Strange creatures, objects with extraordinary powers, and events that couldn't be explained with rational science. Perhaps something about these oddities, these anomalies, would hold the key to defeating his timeless enemy. And it hadn't just been these objects, entities, and events. He'd also discovered some truly exceptional people on his travels, minds and skills that rivaled even his own, despite his age. Perhaps they would be the ones to help him win. With the 13 most brilliant and trusted people the counterbalance ever met, he decided to form a council. And from this council, they forged and directed an organization dedicated to understanding and counteracting the strange in all its forms, with the secret hope that their search into darkness would yield the answer to the Black Moon's downfall. He called it the SCP Foundation. They would secure the anomalous, contain it, and protect all of humanity from its influence. The counterbalance also took on a new title, the fitting of his new role, the Administrator. And even the Black Moon itself was given a moniker, in hopes of robbing it of some of its frightening power. SCP-001 Does the Black Moon Howl? Only at the blind. The year was now 1987. The SCP Foundation had been operating for over a century, and thanks to their secret possession of anomalous wisdom and technology, their own advancement was thousands of years ahead of the rest of humanity. While there still wasn't a silver bullet solution to the Black Moon, and its deadly howls were becoming all the more frequent as the decades went on, the Foundation did have some irons in the fire to combat it. Their ability to gather intel on both the entity itself and its obliteration events had improved considerably, thanks to their new global information network. Their top minds were also working on a highly classified device known as the Singular Conceptual Bunker, which may one day come in handy for combating the extra-dimensional entity directly. But the most valuable piece of information they ever gathered about the Black Moon was this. It couldn't howl when it was being watched. The very act of engaged observation defanged it. The problem is, how can you observe something that doesn't technically exist inside your own reality? In order to pull this off, the Foundation would need to get extremely creative. Thankfully, creative solutions to strange problems are the Foundation's specialty. Flash forward to 1993. Enter Dr. Moto, a brilliant young scientist and conceptual engineer working for the SCP Foundation. With the administrator's consultation, he started the Key Project, an arm of the wider Project Oromasides the umbrella initiative for using modified anomalous objects in the battle against the Black Moon. The goal of the key project was relatively simple. If people couldn't observe the Black Moon directly, then the Foundation could make proxies of the Black Moon that could be observed, almost like a kind of voodoo doll. These new anomalies would only need to satisfy three criteria. The inability to operate when being observed, a hostility to conscious life, and the ability to end conscious life of their own volition when not being observed. Through conceptual engineering, a link theoretically could be forged between these objects and the Black Moon, allowing observation of them to stop the obliteration events. However, despite being a good idea in theory, Dr. Moto's efforts were marred with errors and tragedies. One object wasn't deadly enough, simply appearing behind people in a threatening pose when they weren't looking, Another one killed purely through collateral damage, a giant sculpture of a human head that immediately attempted escape by barging through Site-01, the center for anti-Black Moon operations, and killing 19 people in the process. Another one of Moto's objects, a huge black sphere, simply immediately exploded, killing 12 people. And in the most horrific misstep of all, one of Moto's objects caused a mass death event in a nearby hotel, where 142 people were spontaneously incinerated when the object, a series of interlocking stalactites and stalagmites, were left unobserved for 0.2 seconds. Almost all of Moto's objects were terminated in the aftermath, either being too useless or too dangerous to keep around. The young scientist felt a deep shame, but forged on. He made one truly brilliant creation that satisfied all the criteria, a sculpture, incapable of moving while being watched, but would snap the neck of the nearest conscious entity if it left unobserved for even a fraction of a second. 
Its relatively minimal killing left it easy to contain without causing mass deaths. And despite all of the other deaths that had sadly occurred during the key project, Dr. Moto believed that the lives saved in the long run by stopping the Black Moon's howls would justify the sacrifice. The problem is, the key project didn't stop anything. Not long after this, there was the first recorded double obliteration event in Rome, where a young tourist couple had both been obliterated simultaneously. All the deaths in the key project had been for nothing. The Black Moon was only getting more powerful. The shame and the guilt was too much for Dr. Moto. He left a note in his office reading, We've been looking at nothing. I'm sorry, Administrator. I failed you, sir. Moto's corpse was later found in the sculpture's temporary containment chamber. His neck snapped. The key project was, in summary, shut down, and its one surviving creation transported to Site-19 in late 1993 where it was designated as SCP-173. Another painful failure for the administrator. Back to the drawing board once more. Does the black moon howl? Not while the stars shine. Millennia stretched on. Almost everyone died except the administrator thanks to his gift. Or perhaps curse. As the counterbalance to the black moon. Science marched on. The SCP Foundation marched on. But all this progress, all this power, was nothing against the incomprehensible influence of SCP-001. The Black Moon was howling more frequently than ever, all the way up to the year 3156, when the Foundation launched the Seek Project under the support of Project Oromastes. As more and more people were wiped out in frequent obliteration events, the administrator became painfully aware that perhaps the answers to the Black Moon problem wouldn't be found on Earth. Using state-of-the-art technology, with a little help from the Anomalous, the SCP Foundation began work on an autonomous spacefaring vessel that could search the stars for the key to the Black Moon's destruction. It was an awe-inspiring creation. A huge craft powered by artificial intelligence, with a universal translator, cryogenic units, and hundreds of autonomous drones to perform more targeted searches. Seek was waved off into the unforgiving depths of space. The administrator could only hope that it would come back with worthwhile answers. The first of the three notable planets Seek derived on was one theoretically capable of supporting human life, except for its brutal and constant blizzards and snowstorms. When Seek's drones were deployed, they did discover signs of civilization based around sentient spherical creatures but no signs of actual life remained. Records and statues found across the planet seemed to indicate that the Black Moon was responsible for the destruction of the planet's civilization, causing so many obliteration events that the remaining survivors went mad from the fear and stress, leading to mass death in the ensuing chaos. The next planet was discovered centuries later, in the year 3499. While this planet could also theoretically support human life, it suffered from frequent volcanic eruptions that rendered much of its surface a flaming mess. However, there were still the dormant ruins of a once advanced civilization of conscious beings. Much like the prior planet, they'd been driven extinct by Black Moon obliteration events a century before the Seek even arrived. Unlike the last planet, however, it seems that they accepted their fate and went gently into the night. The planet was now overrun by billions of armored bat-like creatures that operated on pure instinct, and thus were not considered conscious enough to be obliterated. The final planet was reached in 3764, and was the most fruitful of the three discoveries. This planet was hyper-advanced, fully urbanized, and covered in sprawling megacities, with records and technology over a thousand years ahead of Earth. Before the Black Moon killed almost all of them, there were a species of humanoid telepathic fungi, and had developed an awareness of the Black Moon's existence that was on par with that of humanity's. They even had their own equivalent of the SCP Foundation actively working on countermeasures. And most amazingly of all, Seek found one surviving member of the species on the planet, cryogenically frozen. The craft was immediately instructed to collect the survivor and return home for interrogation. The administrator was preparing for what could be the most important conversation since he met the hermit all those thousands of years ago. Does the Black Moon howl? Only when waning. When the surviving creature, codenamed Sage, was returned to Earth, 
the administrator was eager to finally speak with it. Like the rest of its now extinct species, Sage spoke through powerful telepathic mind waves, which only the administrator, thanks to his counterbalance abilities, was able to receive at close range without being harmed. Incidentally, it wasn't long until the very fact of the administrator's nature as a counterbalance came up in the mental conversation. Sage could tell, just by being in his presence. They discovered a number of vital truths over their brief time communicating, that Sage's survival had been pure luck, for starters. The Black Moon is still very much capable of obliterating conscious beings in an unconscious state. The administrator also learned that he was merely the latest in an extremely long line of counterbalances across time, space, and species, though everyone but him had waived this duty, passed it on. Sage had one question to ask the administrator in turn. What is SCB? The singular conceptual bunker, being worked on and perfected for thousands of years by now, by the Foundation's top scientists and conceptual engineers. The administrator replied, Victory, but it will take a very, very long time. Specifically, so long that he would see the stars go out around him, one by one. Shocked, Sage asked him what good victory would do him then. Rather than say it aloud, he replied with a thought. Sage paused and said, I see. How blasphemous of you. Hopefully it works. After this, the administrator proceeded to the singular conceptual bunker and entered it, leaving instructions for the Foundation to be run by a newly formed O5 Council in his indefinite absence. Thousands of years later, in the year 5011, Sage spoke one more time, repeating the words, hopefully, hopefully, before turning solid black and disappearing. The Black Moon had claimed one more victim, but billions more had gone in the interim. The administrator had no more answers to give, at least no more answers that anyone but him would understand. He was inside the singular conceptual bunker now, loaded into a device known as Tome, an experimental memorial module meant to pick up and record all the last messages of every dying civilization across the universe when the time finally came. All he could do was wait, and wait, was exactly what we did. Does the Black Moon howl? Yes. Yes, it does. Years pass. Too many to count. It's a time after names now, and Tome sits in the very center drinking in the end of the universe. The last of all the human colonies across the universe were obliterated by the Black Moon back in the year 7329. So, so, so long ago. But some of the final messages of fear, panic, and distress still echoed around in the administrator's mind. Hello? Is there anyone here? We require assistance. There's... It's, it's taking people every day. We need help. There's barely anyone left. We need help. Hello? Hello? Cabal 0943, we have abandoned the false flesh. We have abandoned the false flesh. The shepherd's crook broken neath my knee. Cabal 0943, Cabal 0943, forgive us! Forgive us! We're going to leave this on. It's so dark outside now. It's blotted out the sun. It's... I have to go now. Respond. First convenience. Emergency. Situation developing. Require additional resources. My fault, your fault, our fault, my fault, your fault, our fault, my fault, your fault, our fault! Rip my brain out now, rip my brain out now! And a small child, the last on Earth simply asking, Hello? into an indifferent microphone. But the administrator had to wait, as the singular conceptual bunker became the solitary conceptual bunker. He was the last conscious being in the universe, and still he needed to wait as the stars went dark outside. Only when there was nothing outside but black was it finally time for the counterbalance's long game to play off. There was nothing left of our universe. The only thing here was the SCB and the Black Moon itself. With everything else gone, the Black Moon only had one conscious being left to obliterate. It opened the door to the solitary conceptual bunker and stepped inside. This... this doesn't make sense. How can the Black Moon, an entity beyond our dimension, beyond physical form, take a step? Good question. The same question, incidentally, that was going through the Black Moon's mind as it entered the bunker. It didn't look at all how the entity expected. It was like a bar, a counter, with rows of bottles behind it, 
a jukebox playing in the corner. A man stood behind the bar cleaning the glasses. The counterbalance. The administrator. He said, <laughs> well, there you are. Certainly took your time. Can I pour you a little something? This only served to increase the Black Moon's confusion. It had form here. Dark smoke compressed into a vaguely humanoid shape. It could speak. It could think. None of this made any sense. The being that had just wiped out all conscious life and seen the very death of the universe was truly and utterly confused. The administrator just seemed to be enjoying himself, preparing for a confrontation hundreds of billions of years in the making. The singular conceptual bunker, or perhaps the singular containment bunker, was a truly ingenious creation. A place of pure ideas, where everything inside was on the same level. Here there were no immortals, no gods, just ideas on the same level playing field. And it was time for the Black Moon's idea to come to an end. It was a trap, and the entire universe was the bait. Without warning, the administrator pulled up a shotgun from underneath the table and unleashed both barrels into the Black Moon's chest. The creature took the hit and fought back, dragging the administrator to the ground, beating him, strangling him. He could feel the light fading under the monster's relentless assault, until he managed to get his desperate hands on a glass ashtray. He beat the monster over the head with it until its grip loosened, and he was able to slide out. There, the killer of the universe was on the ground before him. He grabbed the monster, held it in place, and beat it to death. He was gravely injured by the battle, but the Black Moon was no more. Here in the singular conceptual bunker, he had won. The administrator, no longer the counterbalance in the absence of the Black Moon, hobbled over to the jukebox, produced a single beautiful coin from his pocket. He pushed the coin into the slot, wheezed a pain breath, and said, The thing is, this place is only information. There's nothing else out there. Not even matter. The universe closed its doors a long time ago. This place can go from information back to matter with just the press of a button. <laughs> Let's see what happens when we introduce something to nothing. For a second it looks as though he might fall, but he doesn't. Instead, he slams the button on the jukebox, and with a relieved laugh says, Let there be light. And there was light. From gigantic, indestructible, self-regenerating reptiles to enormous tentacled telepathic organisms, it should come as no surprise that the SCP Foundation has gone head-to-head -head against a lot of large-scale aggressors, or LSAs, in its time. Naturally, a creature of heightened size and aggression can often prove challenging to contain, and the threat these LSAs pose is often far too big to ignore. But anyone familiar with the Foundation will tell you they're not above using any methods necessary to keep these creatures contained. Huge vats of molecular acid, impenetrable cells, disposable D-class personnel, even other SCPs. But what other SCPs could possibly be big enough and tough enough to handle some of the Foundation's biggest and baddest? Meet SCP-5514, otherwise known as the Dragon Slayer. While it might sound like something out of an anime, SCP-5514 is a massive robotic mech designed to take on the worst other SCPs can throw at it. For any who are unfamiliar with the term, a mech or mecha usually refers to an upright standing machine or automaton controlled by a human pilot. What distinguishes a mech from a vehicle is their often humanoid shape, standing bipedally and they are often hundreds of meters tall. All of this is true of SCP-5514. And, in fact, given that it requires a trained member of Foundation staff to operate it, the mech itself requires very little in the way of containment. Only members of Mobile Task Force Ada-5 are trained and authorized to pilot SCP-5514. This is one of the SCP Foundation's specialized units, specifically designed to deal with the threat of large-scale aggressors, much like SCP-5514 itself. But SCP-5514 wasn't discovered or captured by the Foundation for use for the containment of LSAs, nor was it stolen from a foreign military or found buried under the ground. Then, 
Where did it come from? And who built it? Working with the Global Occult Coalition and the government of High Brazil, an anomalous island off the west coast of Ireland, the Foundation themselves constructed SCP-5514 using various anomalous methods and techniques. In 1988, a Foundation site was destroyed by an unidentified LSA, highlighting the inadequacy of the current defenses against these larger, more damage-resistant creatures. The Foundation, the Coalition, and High Brazil formed a joint operation, the Key Project, and examined SCP-2406, an automaton 93 meters tall thought to be created by ancient Mechanites. Together, the Key Project opted to create their own similar machine, viewing it as the best way to defend against further incursions with large-scale aggressors. The construction of SCP-5514 began in 1990. The intention of all parties involved in the Key Project, including the Foundation, was that the Dragon Slayer would be deployed in the event of an attack by an LSA. It would arrive at cities under attack and immediately engage large-scale aggressors in combat. Building of the mech continued at a consistent pace for eight years. However, it was the occurrence of SCP-5391 and subsequent intervention by the O5 Council that accelerated the creation of the Dragon Slayer by any means necessary. On June 30th, 1998, a number of seismic disturbances were detected, including tsunamis, tremors, and volcanic activity both underwater and above ground. What followed was the appearance of multiple large-scale aggressors, which would soon become designated as SCP-5391, the exact kind of scenario that the Dragon Slayer was being built for had already arrived, and the mech was still far from completion. While the Foundation and its allies deployed forces to drive the enormous creatures back to the ocean, Something needed to be done to bring SCP-5514 into the fight, and fast. The O5 Council authorized the use of anomalous materials in the continued construction of the Dragon Slayer, both to speed up the process and have it ready for deployment, but also to give the mech every advantage against the abundance of large-scale aggressors from SCP-5391. As a result, SCP-5514 was designed to incorporate features and technology far beyond that of any conventional military-grade weapons. The first hurdle, how do you power a machine the size of SCP-5514? Naturally, with the most gigantic nuclear furnace there is, the sun. More specifically, a perpetually stable miniaturized sun known as SCP-037, even though it only has a diameter of two inches. This little sucker is better than premium fuel. The surface temperature of SCP-037 is around 5,000 Kelvin, generating plenty of energy to power the SCP-5514 mech. Stored in the Dragon Slayer's chest, this mini-sun is kept stable by subdimensional portals that vent excess energy off this plane of reality, stopping the mech, its pilot, and anything around it from melting. In fact, SCP-037 produces so much juice that only 1% of its energy output is enough to fully power SCP-5514. Now that's the power source sorted, but how do you solve the weight problem? Given the sheer size of SCP-5514, it would be easy for it to be cumbersome and potentially cause catastrophic collateral damage to its surrounding area. Well, the mech's weight is a problem for somewhere else. A whole other dimension, in fact. Much like the excess heat from its power source, various heavy portions of the SCP-5514 mech have their weight shunted off to a tiny pocket dimension. It was ensured during the creation of the mech that this alteration was perfectly calculated, so that SCP-5514 wouldn't lose any mass or density, so it operates as if it were only a fraction of its actual weight. Of course, being weightless makes flight a whole lot easier. Oh, did we forget to mention that? SCP-5514 can fly as well. This feature actually became a part of the mech completely by accident during the construction of SCP-5514, when an attempt to regulate the mech's internal circulation of air led to it having its own gravity field. This allowed SCP-5514 to fly without the aid of any turbines or other means. While this was an unintentional mistake, no attempt has ever been made to correct for it for fear that it could lead to SCP-5514 being grounded permanently. Naturally, going up against creatures so large that they require their own subcategory means that SCP-5514 needs an equally formidable arsenal. So let's move on to talk weaponry. Mounted on the mech's shoulder is a Beowulf Sigurd railgun, 
an anomalous weapon that also doesn't obey the laws of physics at all. The Beowulf Sigurd uses alternate gravity to affect the weight of its targets, causing projectiles to impact with higher velocity. Even the thickest-skinned LSAs wouldn't want to be staring down the barrel end of one of those. Big guns aside, the SCP-5514 mech also wields a cold iron sword. Over 65 feet long, this weapon was contributed to the Dragon Slayer by the High Brazil Royal Court, members of the collaborative key project that created the mech. Sure, a large-scale aggressor with thicker hide might take a few extra swings to draw blood, but it will feel those swings for a long time after, since any wounds inflicted by the cold iron sword will not regenerate. Serving as less of an offensive weapon, the SCP-5514 mech also features a unique armament known as the Thousand Word Arrows. As pretentious as it might sound, within the mech are seven poets. Their role is to write and recite poems that detail the slaying of monsters, and these recitals are then broadcast from the Dragon Slayer. On the surface, this seems to have no practical applications during a fight with LSAs. However, the goal of the Thousand Word Arrows is a form of psychological warfare. The recital of poems telling of the mech's victory and the defeat of large-scale aggressors is intended to have the effect of demoralizing SCP-5514's adversaries while encouraging the pilot during combat. Additionally, worn atop the head of the SCP-5514 mech almost like a hat, is a discus with plasma-coated edges. If the Dragon Slayer needs to deal damage at range, then it can hurl this disc and recall it immediately thanks to built-in electromagnets. In emergency scenarios, if the Cold Iron Sword is damaged or dropped and irretrievable, SCP-5514 is also equipped with an additional melee weapon. Stored in the right arm of the mech is a holdout plasma wrist blade. This superheated blade is strong enough to cut through almost anything. However, this blade is strictly to be used as a backup weapon. Finally, should all else fail, one of SCP-5514's greatest strengths can also be used as a deadly weapon. The Emergency Sunvent allows a fraction of the excess power from SCP-037 to be released, at the risk of causing massive damage, not only to LSAs, but to any civilians or structures nearby. It is because of the destructive risk involved that this weapon is only authorized to be used as a final resort, and luckily SCP-5514 is currently undefeated. Since the arrival of multiple large-scale aggressors as a result of SCP-5391, the SCP-5514 mech has managed to successfully eliminate 12 of these LSA creatures, either by terminating or otherwise incapacitating them. Given that its completion was fast-tracked through the use of anomalous elements, SCP-5514's first combat deployments also served as field tests of the mech's operation and the various weapons and features. Arriving in Tokyo overseen by the Foundation's own Captain Rosales and Dr. Kaori, SCP-5514's first target was a creature designated LSA Wake-02, as well as several other unidentified large creatures. As the LSA was about to attack Tokyo Harbor, SCP-5514 was dispatched, its arrival heralded by the Thousand Word Arrows. Champion, champion, exalt in the glory of the Dragon Slayer, the poets recited. Surprisingly, the poetry worked, hearing it had a noticeable effect on LSA Wake-02, causing the creature to back away shrieking. With a single throw of the rounded, recoiling plasma, SCP-5514 immediately beheaded Wake-02, damaging a number of the other nearby LSAs as it retrieved the disc via its electromagnets. Once again, the thousand-word arrows cheered on the mech and the pilot reciting, The vicious beast slain, gone to those which were once bane. After dispatching several of the minor LSAs with its cold iron sword, SCP-5514 became aware that Wake-02 was not fully down for the count. A second head had protruded from the mouth of the creatures first, issuing some sort of retreat call to the remaining LSAs in Tokyo Harbor. This second head then shot towards SCP-5514, narrowly missing its leg but allowing other LSAs to close the distance and prepare an attack. Luckily, the SCP-5514 mech sword cleaved the beast in two. The mech began firing on the remains of Wake-02 with its Beowulf Sigurd railgun launching itself into the air and flying towards the target while bringing its cold iron sword down through the air. With a single motion, SCP-5514 brought the blade all the way down the LSA's body, from the creature's head to its caudal fin, gutting the large-scale aggressor 
and splitting its entire body in two. After one final squirm, both halves were finally still. SCP-5514 had passed its first field test. The mech functioned exactly as designed, all its various weapons and features working in tandem to defeat a creature far too large and powerful for any conventional force to handle. And thus the deed was done. Exult, exult in the glory of the Dragon Slayer. The Thousand Word Arrows called out as the other LSAs retreated. One cannot help but feel cautiously optimistic about our chances of survival, knowing that the Foundation has SCP-5514 as the first line of defense against huge, monstrous beings that threaten humanity. As the situation with SCP-5391 continues, the SCP-5514 mech remains on the front line, standing between innocent human beings and the looming shapes of multiple large-scale aggressors. With creatures that pose such a large-scale threat, it certainly is lucky that disparate groups were able to put aside their differences and work together to build a large-scale mech. And because they did, now we have the Dragon Slayer on our side. The year is 1939. It's the dead of night in Pingfang, a district of the Harbin Prefecture in Japanese Imperial-occupied China. A squadron of over a hundred Chinese rebels led by Lieutenant Wang Wei, clutching Bergman MP-18 machine guns, hurry through the streets towards their destination. The bioweapons lab operated by Unit 731, and monstrous, terrifying Japanese Surgeon General Shiro Ishii. It is a mission of liberation and revenge. If you know anything about Unit 731, just hearing the name will send a chill down your spine, just as it did for the Chinese soldiers hoping to perform a surprise assault on the unit's complex of horrors. Rumors had spread from the Chinese prisoners of war taken there, and the knowledge of the horrible things happening to their countrymen inside that building made their blood boil with white hot fury. Their mission was simple. They would launch an attack on the complex when the unit least expected it, save as many prisoners as they could, while also taking revenge on as many unit soldiers as they could get their hands on. But what the brave soldiers didn't know is that they were in for a battle they couldn't hope to win, because what they were fighting was not in any traditional sense human. They were about to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with SCP-4007, an elite group of anomalous Japanese super-soldiers known as the Ping Fang Five, a name spoken in fear by their enemies and victims for what little time both remained alive. The Chinese rebels were hiding in a stand of trees outside the fortress, waiting for the right moment to strike, when the Ping Fang Five suddenly beat them to the punch and descended upon them. The plan was thrown into chaos when the trees burst into flames without so much as a hint of artillery being fired. The soldiers, all hardened men of war, began to grow scared. But then they saw something even more terrifying standing there amongst the flames. First Lieutenant Mitsuo Kitano, also known as Lightning Bolt, or SCP-4007-1 to the Foundation. One of his hands was wreathed in blue sparks of electricity, and the others he wielded a Type 14 Nambu pistol. Lieutenant Kitano continued his attack, using his anomalous lightning to blow away soldier after soldier. When the shocked rebels tried to return fire, they found that they couldn't land a single shot. Kitano dodged every bullet. The second wave of the assault came from behind, as the rebels tried to flee Kitano's wrath. Private Takashi Honda, also known as the Ogre, or SCP-4007-2, charged into the fray. He effortlessly wielded a Type 11 machine gun and rained bullets down upon his unsuspecting foes. They shot back at him, but the bullets seemed to just bounce off his skin. He wasn't bothered by them in the slightest. He just smiled and continued firing. The rebels quickly realized that the whole thing had been a trap, but what had given them away? As if on cue, one of their own soldiers turned and began firing on his fellow soldiers with his MP-18. This man wasn't a rebel. In fact, he wasn't even Chinese. It was Corporal Jochiro Aida, also known as the Fox, or SCP-4007-3. How could he have possibly infiltrated the squadron? The answer is simple. He's an anomalously brilliant liar. In fact, it's impossible to not believe a single thing that Corporal Ida says, making him a true expert in espionage. Not a single one of the other rebels ever had a chance of sniffing him out before the doomed mission. 
If this betrayal surprised them, then what came next must have seemed like something out of a nightmare. Lieutenant Wang Wei, the man who'd spearheaded the entire mission, turned and began picking off his own troops with his pistol. The surviving soldiers didn't understand. Had the lieutenant gone mad? They tried to shoot him, but just like the others, he dodged effortlessly and continued to murder them. That's because he wasn't Lieutenant Wang Wei at all. Wei had been murdered in the forest earlier that night and replaced by Private Teruo Nishimura, also known as SCP-4007-5, or the Shapeshifter. The Ping Fang Five had infiltrated and compromised the mission from before it had even begun. They never even stood a chance. During the chaos of the massacre, a few of the rebels had managed to escape, running through a nearby clearing into a thicket of trees. If they could survive, then perhaps they could regroup and lead a second assault on another day. They had no hope of survival during a head-on conflict with these anomalous super soldiers. They needed to get away and form a new strategy. But gunshots started ringing out through the forest, tearing into their bodies and dropping the men one by one. They tried to return fire, but they couldn't even see who was shooting at them. It seemed to come from all directions. The rebels' dying thoughts were that the trees around them must have been crawling with Japanese troops. The reality was even more frightening. It was only one man. Private Shigeru Matsui, codenamed Smoke, for this ability to become invisible at will. To the Foundation, he's known as SCP-4007-4, the last member of the Ping Fang Five the deadliest troops in the entire Imperial Japanese Army. But unlike many of the biological anomalies catalogued by the SCP Foundation, the Ping Fang Five were not born, they were made. In case you aren't familiar with the infamous Unit 731 and their horrifying complex in Ping Fang, this unit was the secret department of the Japanese Army ordered into existence by Emperor Hirohito himself for one sinister purpose, researching chemical and biological weapons for the Japanese Imperial Army. Their leader, the Surgeon General Shiro Ishii, was essentially given blanket permission to do whatever he deemed necessary in order to achieve results for his emperor and his nation. Ishii took that directive and ran with it, unleashing pseudoscientific evil on a level matched only by the Nazi extermination camps in Europe. Experimental weapons and horrific diseases were tested on captured Chinese civilians, political dissidents, and prisoners of war. Thousands of people met horrific ends through execution, experimentation, and vivisection, which is the dissection of a subject that is still very much alive. How does this relate to the Ping Fang Five and SCP-4007? It all comes back to a top-secret project overseen by Ishii himself, Project Shinka. While well, Unit 731 was established in 1935, in 1937 they began working in collaboration with the Imperial Japanese Anomalous Matters Examination Agency. Think of it as Imperial Japan's hypernationalist answer to the SCP Foundation. They had become aware of the existence of anomalous individuals in Imperial controlled territories, and General Ishii wanted to know whether the powers manifested in these anomalous individuals could be induced in others through forced organ removal and transplantation. To test this hypothesis, Ishii had the Japanese secret police round up anomalous individuals in Imperial territory en masse. They were subjected to mass vivisections, with the intention of isolating and removing anomalous organs. It was an act so positively genocidal in proportion that East Asia had statistically fewer anomalous humans than they should to this day. Ishii's intention was to transplant the organs into loyal volunteers from the Japanese military in order to create an unbeatable military force, perfect soldiers who would win the war for them. The vast majority of these twisted experiments were complete failures, leading to the higher-ups at Unit 731 almost writing Project Shinka off as a waste of time and cancelling the whole thing. But there were soon five notable exceptions, the very scary individuals you've already met. Not only did every member of the Ping Fang Five end up with a specific anomalous superpower as a result of the experiments, they also experienced incredible anomalous prowess across the board. Members of the Five boast extended longevity, meaning they rarely show their age. Enhanced physical abilities, including faster reflexes, incredible senses, and immense physical strength. They also appear to have advanced mental development, displaying phenomenal tactical and strategic reasoning, as well as the ability to effortlessly learn, read, and speak multiple languages. 
like Japanese, English, Mandarin Chinese, Russian, and German. Of course, Japan eventually lost the war, but the Pingfang Five had no intentions of ending their fight. They continued their missions long after Japan formally surrendered, causing chaos and violence across East Asia. After several unsuccessful engagements with isolated members of the Pingfang Five, leading to the deaths of many Foundation agents and civilians, the Foundation formed Mobile Task Force 551, aka MacArthur's Dogs, an elite group of operatives trained for the specific mission of bringing down the Pingfang Five. While the hunt rages on, three of the five are already dead. SCP-4007-1, Mitsuo Kitano, the man who can unleash bursts of electricity, met his end in Burma in 1948. During a procedure called Operation Smokehouse, 551 engaged Kitano in combat in the jungle. As was one of his trademark techniques, he attempted to use his electricity powers to burn down the jungle and escape during the chaos. However, the Foundation operatives surrounded and boxed him in. He couldn't escape and when the fires were put out, he was found dead on the ground. The apparent cause of death was smoke inhalation. SCP-4007-2, Takashi Honda, the man with bulletproof skin, died in 1957 in the Philippines. 551 engaged him in combat in a mission dubbed Operation Homewrecker, which culminated in them calling down an airstrike on him. In the aftermath, Honda was found dead, but his cause of death was determined as having been from a powerful electric shock. And finally, SCP-4007-3, Joichiro Aida, the man with the silver tongue was found dead a year later in 1958. His corpse was discovered in his room in Guiyang, southern China. He appeared to have been strangled to death, and interestingly, there was evidence that he tried to engage in the shootout with his killer, but hadn't succeeded in preventing his own murder. All of these circumstances were somewhat mysterious, but the Foundation didn't investigate them much further after the bodies were tagged and bagged. SCP-4007-5 Tiro Nishimura, the shapeshifter, is still on the run today, while SCP-4007-4 Shigeru Matsui, the Invisible Man, is doing just the opposite. He lives in Sarawak, Malaysia, and works in open cooperation with the SCP Foundation to help track down the fifth member of the Ping Fang Five. Not much has changed in the 64 years since the death of Joichiro Aida. It seemed like the search for SCP-4007-4 had gone cold until a Foundation archival clerk found something suspicious. The original paper copy of the SCP-4007 document, which was dated a year before the Foundation had supposedly discovered the existence of SCP-4007. As the archival worker dug further, they found a number of unsettling discoveries that alter the true meaning of SCP-4007. In the original paper documents, each dead member of the Pingfang Five had organs missing and each subsequent member's death involved a power possessed by a former member. Two was electrocuted, and three's gun was useless, as the killer had been wearing two's bulletproof skin. Who was behind this? Why? And most importantly of all, how had this all been forgotten? Through more digging, the Foundation discovered the truth about SCP-4007-4. His powers weren't invisibility. They were anti-memetic. He can make people forget him at will, essentially editing their memories so he could do whatever he wanted without detection. Like, for example, murdering his team members and stealing their powers. They even managed to find an archive letter from 4 to 3, begging for his help in fighting some kind of unknown monster, something that would require their combined powers to face, whether they ended up being as five separate men or one man with all of their powers. This whole time, SCP-4007-4 had been playing the Foundation like a fiddle, using their resources to help him track down the final member of the Ping Fang Five, to recruit him into one final mission, or murder him and steal his powers. But that still leaves one question. What is this mission? What is this monster? The Foundation managed to find out, at least partially. They charted the death locations of each of the three dead Ping Fang members and the living location of SCP-4007-4 and discovered something amazing. Four of the five points on a perfect pentagon, centering on the South China Sea. The Foundation also estimated that the Pentagon would reveal the location of SCP-4007-5 at the final point, but his location isn't nearly as interesting as what resides at the center of this massive geographical pentagon. Foundation divers discovered huge numbers of sunken Japanese battleships, downed planes, 
and thousands of bones littering the seabed. Based on the damages to these vessels, it was clear that they hadn't been shot or blown up. No, they had been torn apart by something obscenely huge and powerful underneath the water. The Pentagon, a significant shape in sorcery, is likely a massive supernatural containment ritual, keeping whatever unspeakable horror is lurking under the ground there from escaping. A containment ritual that could only be maintained by five special individuals in five special places. It was in this moment that the Foundation came upon a truly horrifying revelation. They had misjudged the intentions of Project Shinka. It was never about creating assets for the war against the Allies. It was about a war against something else entirely. Something much more dangerous than, and deadly, than the squabbles between men. It was about the entity that lurked below. A creature that nobody understood, and that no conventional weapon can fight. And if the ritual is ever broken, and the beast is allowed to rise, the Ping Fang Five will be the very least of our problems. I used to complain about work all the time. The long hours, the disrespect for my boss, getting home exhausted, aching, and sunburned. I worked in construction a lifetime ago. I'd give anything to go back to that now. Was that they always say? You don't know what you've got until it's gone. Maybe I deserve the hand I've been dealt. I haven't been a good person. I don't play well with others. There was an argument with my foreman when I got a little too heated. I just couldn't rein in my temper. The hammer I'd been using all day was still in my hand, but I digress. I used to build things with my hands, but I'm in a different line of work now, if you can call it work. That would imply I get paid. I clock in every morning, and I get to go home afterward. I don't. I'm a prisoner, really. A glorified lab rat, and property of the all-powerful SCP Foundation. I've been here about three weeks, and everyone always says D-classes like us last about a month here. So, uh, the clock is ticking down to zero for me. I haven't had to do anything too dangerous yet, but like I said, it's just a matter of time. I'm sitting in my cell the same windowless box I've spent every day for the past three weeks, when a god bursts in and grabs me by the arm. What's going on? I ask, but he ignores me. Of course, why make conversation with a lab rat? Better not to think of us as human at all. He yanks me down the hall, opens a door, and shoves me inside. There's several other D-class in there already, and they're staring at something in the corner that I can't quite make out. I start to turn around and to take a look at the rest of the room, but a voice comes over the loudspeaker, cold and clinical. Look at the statue in the corner. Do not take your eyes off it. Well, when a disembodied voice at the SCP Foundation tells you to look at something, you better do it. So I look. It's a, a sculpture made from concrete and rebar. It looks pretty harmless, but I've heard enough screams through the walls to know they don't keep too many harmless things caged up here. Whatever this thing really is, I don't want to know what it'll do to me when my back is turned. I stare at it, unblinking, feeling my eyes burn and tear up from the dry air and concentration. I'm scared to close my eyes for even a second, determined not to be the first one in here to break. But something out there has other plans for me, for us. I hear a warbling sound like a motor struggling to start, the sudden crash of thunder outside, and then the room goes black. For a second I think I've gone blind, but then I hear the other guy screaming, the yelling of scientists behind the wall. Somehow the power's gone out. I, I can't see anything, but I can hear the sound of stone scraping against itself. The snap of breaking bones, the thud of a limp body slumping over to the floor. The room comes into focus again, as the backup generator kicks in and fills the space with weak fluorescent light. But, but something's different. Something's wrong. The statue in the corner is gone. The other two men are on the floor, heads twisted around backwards, and the door is standing wide open. Is this a, a trap? A trick of some kind? If I run out that door, will a guard be waiting there for me? I don't know. But whatever might happen to me if I try can't be any worse than what will happen if I stay right here. Through the wall, I hear the sickening snapping sound again. A corpse thudding to the ground. They didn't plan this. Something in their experiment went horribly wrong for them. Maybe, just maybe, it went right for me. I don't give it a second thought. I'm out the door, running through the dimly lit halls through the maze of identical corridors in search of some kind of exit. All around me there's chaos. Guards firing their weapons at inhuman shapes that I catch a brief glimpse of as I run past. Scientists yelling for help, people going as fast as they can towards danger and away from it. I'm so caught up in it all, 
I don't even notice when I run right into a woman in the white lab coat knocking us both to the ground. I scramble to my feet and look her with wide eyes, waiting for her to turn me in to, to call the guards, but she doesn't. I, I'm so sorry, I stammer. She holds out a hand, gesturing for me to help her to her feet. So, so I do. Watch your step there, she says with a knowing smile. I can't help but notice how beautiful she is. Twinkling brown eyes and thick black hair. Then I spot them, tucked under her hair but unmistakable. She has a pair of fox ears on top of her head. It hits me in rapid succession then, all the things about this woman that don't look quite right. Her unusually long nails, too sharp and pointed for lab work. The feral glint in her eyes, that halting cadence of her voice. This woman is not an employee of the SCP Foundation. She's doing the same thing I am, taking advantage of the situation to try to escape. I'll uh, be more careful from now on, ma'am, I say. She winks and turns down the hall. I can see a tail poking out beneath the bottom of her lab coat. Safe travels, I call after her. She laughs, a dangerous sound, like she's not the one who needs to worry about staying safe. And I wonder what might have happened if I had caught her in a worse mood. Good thing my mom taught me my manners. Now which way should I go from here? Should I follow the woman? I get the feeling she doesn't want any company and I prefer to stay on her good side. As I'm thinking it through, I hear a small popping sound behind me, like a vacuum in the air being filled all of a sudden. I spin around as I guy standing there, or in the area as you please. Blonde hair, green eyes, wearing jeans and a t-shirt that says Mothman Fan Club in red letters. This guy looks pretty out of place, more the type you'd see browsing a comic book store. But after my prior strange encounter, pff, I don't know not to assume anything. Hey man, what's going on? He asks me. I stare back, not sure what to say. What I miss? He continues. I feel like I was gone for ages. Um, I just stood to our collective surroundings. The sound of alarms blaring and voices crying out for backup. The inhuman shrieks of creatures being forced back into their cells. There's a, a lot going on. <sighs> yeah, seems like it. The guy sighs. You wouldn't happen to know how to get out of here, would you? I ask hopefully. He shakes his head. Sorry, I don't really come and go through the door here. Guess I'll just go back to my room until things calm down a bit. You want anything? I got a mini fridge in there. He offers. Mm, no thanks. Suit yourself, man. He shoves his hands back in his pockets and walks away, whistling a tune to himself. If he's this unfazed by teleporting into the middle of a complete madhouse, I don't even want to know what kind of stuff he's seen. Nice enough kid though. Probably better company than anyone or anything else in this place. If I'm not going to take him up on his offer though, I should keep moving before someone notices I'm not where I'm supposed to be. I round the corner just in time to see another body drop. I whirl around looking for that horrible statue, but I don't see it. Instead, I see what looks like a man, dressed in all black, wearing a mask in the shape of a bird's face with a long pointed beak. He's carrying like an old school doctor's bag and he's bending down to inspect the body of the god that just keeled over. I should keep running. I should do something. But I can't look away. The man in black pulls a syringe full of thick green liquid from his bag and injects it into the corpse. To my horror, the body begins to move, thrashing around, hands opening and closing, grasping for something. It sits up reanimated, but wrong. Its eyes are bulging and vacant like a goldfish. Its mouth hangs slack. As this zombie climbs to his feet, the figure in all black turns to look at me, eyes shining from beneath his mask. Hello, my good fellow. How are you feeling today? He calls to me, his voice polished and polite. I'm fine, I shout, my hands shaking, my chest tight. The doctor tilts his head to the side thoughtfully. You don't look well, my friend. Perhaps you could allow me to examine you. The zombie shuffles towards me and the doctor opens his bag. There is this pestilence raging through this land, you see. I'm not gonna stick around to find out what that exam might look like or what he might try to do in the service of curing me. No thanks, I don't have health insurance! That is all I can think to say as I turn and run the way back I came. I still have no idea where an exit might be, how I might get out of here. It all looks the same, one long stretch of tile and white. I guess a place like the Foundation isn't gonna have red neon signs telling you how to escape. Uh, but this place can't go on forever, can it? I'm starting to have my doubts. Before I can get too lost in my own hopelessness, the biggest man I've ever seen comes lumbering down the hall toward me. I work with some pretty big guys in construction, massive behemoths who could carry steel beams like they were pool noodles. But this man? Something else entirely. He's gotta be like, what, 8 feet tall? The fist that they look like they could crush my skull in one hit. I better get out of this monster's way if I know what's good for me. But as he passes me, he waves and gives me a great big friendly, if unnaturally wide, smile. 
<laughs> Beautiful day, isn't it? He bellows in that booming French accent of voice. With his other hand, he picks his teeth with something white. A closer look reveals to be a shot of bone. I have to imagine it's human. His lips are stained dark with blood. You look lost! Can I help you with something? A helpful people eater. <laughs> what a guy. I keep my distance, but decide to try my luck. You wouldn't, uh, happen to know where the exit is, I say. He beams at me, thrilled by my question. I'm so glad you asked, it's this way! He points down the hall to the left. Just follow that hall all the way down and take the only right! That should get you where you're going! Thanks! I give him a wave back as I head that way. As I go, I can hear the giant singing opera to himself, something Italian. Reminds me of a record my grandma used to play a long time ago. Maybe this will get me free. Maybe it won't. But it's more information than I had a second ago. Might as well give it a shot. If I make it through this, I'm gonna be in the best shape of my life from all the running I've done today. Maybe I'll try to do a marathon. Or maybe I shouldn't get ahead of myself. There's no one else down this particular hall. At least no one that I can see. I slow my pace to a steady walk, keeping my eyes and ears alert for any potential threats. So far, so good. I reach the other side of the hall and take a right turn and... nothing. Just the wall. That giant son of a gun lied to me! I guess that's what I get for asking a cannibal for directions. I guess I'm lucky he just misled me instead of having me for dessert. I'm about to play my next move when I feel something nudge against the back of my leg. I turn and there's what I can only describe as a blob. Just a large mass of orange slime wrapped around my legs making a friendly high-pitched gurgle. I should be suspicious of it after everything I've seen, but I'm not. I just get the feeling that this thing has my best interest in heart. Hey, buddy. I pat its slimy surface and it ripples delightedly, making another gurgling sound. It's kinda cute, honestly. I smell the scent of freshly brewed coffee, one of my favorite smells in the world. <laughs> I haven't had a decent cup in years. All of a sudden, I feel this overwhelming sense of happiness, of hope. Even if it's foolish to think so, I honestly believe that everything's gonna be alright. This strange little friendly slime has given me the strength to carry on. Ah, I wish I had a plushy version of this thing. There's a sudden tickling sensation along my legs and I laugh, pushing the slime away gently. <laughs> hey, stop that! It coos apologetically and bumps itself against me like a stray dog asking for scratches behind the ears. I wonder for a second if I could take this thing with me. But what would I even feed it? What kind of life could I give a domesticated slime creature? Better to leave it with the people who know how to care for it, even if they're mad scientists. I give it another pat, then head on my way. The slime oozes off in the opposite direction. I have to find more new friends, I imagine. I had no idea there was anything nice in here, with everything horrible I've seen today. Warms my cold heart just a little bit. It's strange. I've been walking for a while and I haven't seen anyone else. It's eerily quiet over here. I can I can't hear a thing except for that alarm in the distance. Not sure when all the screaming went quiet or where all the gods went. It's peaceful, but I have to admit it's eerie. There's no way it's this easy. There's no way I'll just be able to walk out of here. Life doesn't work like that, especially not here. My eyes dot around, watching for any potential danger as I go. Maybe all the action is on the other side of the facility. Maybe something broke out of containment that's so big, so dangerous that all hands are on deck to contain it. Or maybe they're all dead, and I'm next. Nah, nah, I, I, I shouldn't think like that. I feel the hairs on the back of my neck prickle, and I have that paranoid feeling of being watched. Like eyes burning into me. I glance behind me, but there's no one there. I stop walking, but I don't hear any other footsteps. Calm down. There's no one here with you. I tell myself, just keep moving. I turn my eyes back to the path ahead of me and I freeze. What was that? I saw something just for a second. Something long, thin, spindly, like a stick bug, but much, much bigger. When I look for it, it it's gone, but I know that I saw it. Well, oh, this place has now driven me insane. I glance to the side and there it is again. For a split second so fast, I could almost convince myself I imagined it. If I were at home or walking down an ordinary street, I might think I, I had, but I'm not anywhere ordinary. And a slender monster that can hide my peripheral vision only to be spotted for a millisecond at a time? That seems par for the course in a place like this. There! I just saw it again! It's like, it wants me to know it's here, but that I'll, I'll never be able to pin it down. I, I'm not playing mind games with that monster. Forget it. I'll, I'll keep moving. Another flash of the creature, closer than it was before. Whatever, you don't scare me! I say out loud. I'm lying, but I hope it can't tell. 
If I just play it cool, maybe this thing will get bored and find someone else to menace. I haven't been running for a long time now, but my heart is still pounding. I can taste metal in the back of my throat. Suddenly all the sounds from before are back. The gunfire, the screaming, the shriek of alarms. I made my way back to the action. One sound drowns out all the rest. A deafening roar. Animalistic and powerful and hateful. It reminds me of a dinosaur in a movie, but with a power that makes my bones rattle and my teeth chatter. The roar is followed by more screaming and a massive crash, the crunch of wood and stone. There's another roar, more distant than before. Wait, whatever made that sound, it, it just broke out. I better left a pretty big hole in its wake. I follow the sound and find exactly what I hope I would. A massive opening in the wall and the sweet feeling of a breeze coming through. I couldn't find the exit, but this thing just made one for me. I don't waste any more time. I make a break for it, dancing around rubble and pools of corrosive acid and sprinting into the nearby forest. I'm ducking under branches, dotting around trees, and I run until I'm seeing spots in my lungs are gasping for air. I don't know how far I'll make it, if there's a town nearby or any kind of shelter, but I promise one thing. If I survive, I'm gonna be a better person. I'll get it right this time. I'll earn my second chance at life. SCP-682 had escaped containment, and it was all hands on deck at the SCP Foundation to try and stop the creature's rampage. All unarmed personnel were running to escape before 682 had a chance to rip them apart, as the security team bravely fought to incapacitate the hard-to-destroy reptile long enough to return him to his acid tank. 682 was on an all-out offensive, stomping through the SCP's item gallery and spewing acid at anyone who came within range. People, items, and parts of the room alike were melting and sizzling as 682 attacked. It was an absolute bloodbath, and you'd have to be insane to try and fight back against it. However, one being remained unfazed by the chaos, and stood proud in the face of the omnicidal monster. It was another SCP, one who had broken free from its glass display case in the commotion. Who dares disturb the Prime Minister Sinister? It said in a high tinny voice. I shall rip your eyes from their sockets and force you to eat them. SCP-682 stopped to see who had threatened him. It was almost laughable that this thing had dared to make such a violent threat, because there was no way that this little thing would be able to stand up to the unkillable 682. But its size didn't stop it from trying to pick a fight all the same. The SCP was a tiny robot made from junk, which looked more like a sculpture made from scrap that was found on the side of the road than a functional automaton. Its head was made of an upside-down voltmeter, giving it the appearance of a smiling face, and its arms were made of wrenches. It was capable of walking around, though it seemed to have difficulty moving, as it was very top-heavy. It shook a rusty fist at SCP-682 and continued to threaten him, shouting, You do not know the fury you have unleashed! Robo-Lord the Destructor will end you! SCP-682 swiped at the robot. Annoyed by its continued attempts to antagonize him, the robot toppled over and struggled to stand again, but when it did, it ran for 682's feet. It started to grab at 682's toes, hitting them with its wrench hands. As you might expect, this had almost no effect on 682. You do realize you are weak, pathetic, said 682, raising his claw to get a better look at the annoying little robot. It responded, Lies and slander! The Mayor of Mayhem is the most powerful being in existence! Before promptly losing its grip on 682's claw and falling to the floor. Now 682 was really getting tired of this thing. He prepared to swipe at it again, this time using his full strength, which would certainly smash the robot to pieces. But luckily for the robot, its pestering had distracted 682 just long enough for the Foundation's security to sneak up on him. Before 682 had a chance to smash the robot, the Foundation fired on him with a volley of rockets, reducing him to a misshapen lump. The security team collected up 682's remains, ready to put them back into a backup acid tank. But the task was made slightly more difficult by the fact that the robot was running around underfoot, trying in vain to now attack them instead. What was this strange little robot that thought it could attack the unkillable lizard 682? Meet SCP-1370, appropriately nicknamed the Pesterbot by Foundation personnel. Pesterbot is a small robot made of junk that displays sentience and the ability to move despite having no power source. Everything about SCP-1370 defies common sense, 
The voltmeter that serves as its head contains no sensors, but it seems unable to see if the voltmeter is covered. Its arms and legs are made of wrenches, and its wooden torso contains a speaker which it communicates through a tinny, monotone voice. Pesterbot lives in SCP Gallery 27, in a glass display case which is 125 centimeters tall, 50 centimeters wide, and 75 centimeters long. Level 2 personnel and higher are allowed to remove the robot from containment at their discretion, but penalties will be incurred for anyone who doesn't return it to its case. Due to its impractical top-heavy design, Pesterbot falls over frequently when it walks around. This led the Foundation to believe that he was created as an art project and was later somehow imbued with anomalous properties, rather than being made with the intent of being sentient. Pesterbot has demonstrated a high capacity for learning, having been taught how to speak in English, French, and Latin. However, the major factor hampering attempts to further test its intelligence has nothing to do with its robotic processing power. No, it's because of its poor attitude. Pesterbot's encounter with SCP-682 and the cockiness it expressed in the moment wasn't an aberration. This SCP really believes it's a killing machine, and as a result it will pick a fight with anyone and anything that moves. This even includes its own reflection. And as a result, the glass of its container must be made as non-reflective as possible to prevent the robot from damaging the case or itself in attempts to fight its mirror self. Though its most commonly used nickname in the Foundation is Pesterbot, SCP-1370 also goes by a variety of self-given epithets, including Doombot 2000, Robolord the Destructor, and Darth Claw Killflex. It can be made to add new names to this list through encouragement by staff, and one time they even managed to add the name Pesterbot, as well as the even more ridiculous Patheticon the Gargalmost to its lexicon of names. As you may have surmised, Pesterbot is classified as safe and is treated by most SCP Foundation employees as a humorous oddity rather than a legitimate threat. Many tests have been done on Pesterbot, and they've all conclusively determined that the robot is incapable of inflicting any damage to its opponents. In fact, Pesterbot is more a danger to itself than to anything around it, both because it's incredibly clumsy and awkward, and because it frequently picks fights with other SCPs who are far more powerful than it. One such scenario that could have gone far worse for Pesterbot than it did was its encounter with SCP-846, also known as RoboDude, one of the many Dr. Wondertainment products currently kept in Foundation containment. RoboDude is an ordinary-looking toy robot that, upon request, can produce up to 350 robo-accessories that function as real weapons. RoboDude can deploy everything from a rocket launcher to a flamethrower to a gun that shoots out an unknown species of insect that can chew through wood. However, RoboDude seems to not be sentient, and is unable to use these weapons unless asked to. That ultimately worked out in the favor of Pesterbot. During another SCP-682 escape, the two robots were brought into contact as they both had been broken out of their respective containment spaces during the brouhaha. RoboDude, searching for a RoboPal to play with, came upon Pesterbot, who immediately started spouting its usual overdramatic threats. I am the Crushmaster, doomed to all I survey. Pesterbot said. Gaze upon my might and weep. Identify yourself that I might know whose destruction I shall sow. RoboDude, not programmed to know how to respond to such a statement, simply responded by asking Pesterbot if it wanted to play. Pesterbot continued to trash talk RoboDude, until RoboDude decided the best way to play with its new pal was to engage it in its Robo Dance mode. Pesterbot accepted the challenge, saying, Activate all that you wish, but your fate is sealed. The Killotron cannot be defeated. I shall render you unto dust with my mad dancing skills. The two robots proceeded to engage in a dance battle, which the awkwardly shaped Pesterbot failed miserably at. While RoboDude was a competent dancer, Pesterbot could only gyrate pathetically before it fell over and rolled around the ground, hopelessly out of time to the music coming from RoboDude's speakers. The song ended, and RoboDude declared, Robo dance is complete, Robo pal. Pesterbot was unable to accept its failure and replied, Ha, pathetic one. You have been schooled in the art of the dance by none other than the Meccano Basher, scourge of a thousand worlds. Kneel before me before I end your worthless existence. Robo Dude, unimpressed with Pesterbot's poor sportsmanship, deployed its hydrogen cannon, which it was programmed to do whenever it detected a sore loser. Fortunately for Pesterbot, Hydrogen Cannon was just the name for Robo Dude's water pistol, 
While Pesterbot will attempt to fight anything that moves, the truth is this robot will attack virtually anything it perceives as being even slightly alive. This is perhaps best illustrated by one of the tests of Pesterbot's abilities that involve putting a small speaker at the base of a potted houseplant and speaking through it from another room. The plant was placed across from Pesterbot in the testing chamber, and the interaction was monitored by researchers from outside. Researcher Davies spoke through the speaker in the plant pot. He asked Pesterbot if he could hear him, and it answered, Who dares? All souls will burn. You will feel the sharp sting of my wrath. Identify yourself so that I may sing damnation upon you as you die. The robot began approaching the plant. Davies, speaking as the plant, identified himself. I am a split-leaf philodendron, a semi-woody shrub with large glossy leaves. At this point, he had to try very hard not to laugh at the absurdity of this test and the robot's reaction. He continued, These leaves can grow up to three feet long. Pesterbot used its wrench to try and wrestle with the leaves, but was bested by the mighty plant and unable to cause any damage. Enraged by its failure, it said, Your mockery spells your doom. I have arrived. You will be crushed betwixt my digits. Pesterbot then fell over and was unable to right itself. It struggled and spent six minutes trying to stand before its flailing knocked over the plant, which did nothing to help and in fact pinned the robot to the ground. It was at this point that the researchers, who had taken time to compose themselves after several laughing fits, entered the chamber and removed Pesterbot in order to place it back in its containment case. Despite how non-threatening Pesterbot is, there is actually one situation in the Foundation's history where it actually posed a somewhat serious threat. When mobile task forces were sent in to rescue survivors of the events at Site-13, also known as SCP-1730, they were attacked by alternate universe versions of a variety of creatures kept in Foundation containment. One of these creatures was Pesterbot, who in that universe somehow gained control of a larger mechanical body constructed of discarded pieces of machinery. It threw other pieces of metal scrap at the task force as they tried to leave the site, shouting in a much deeper and more intimidating voice, I am reborn to breathe devastation upon this fetid earth, pitiful humans. You will feel the dark sting of my never-ending torment. Members of the task force could see the original Pesterbot body on top of the larger metal construct, waving its arms madly. The task force opened fire to little effect. Pesterbot tossed another piece of scrap at them, just narrowly missing. One task force member threw a frag grenade at the robot, which it caught, blowing up its hand. Another one was able to jump into the air and reach the tiny robot atop the larger body, knocking it against the wall and shattering it. Even in the reality where Pesterbot was able to build itself a larger body, it still ultimately wasn't able to put up that much of a fight. Poor Pesterbot. Doomed to be a failure in this and apparently every other reality. That's the story of SCP-1370, also known as Pesterbot, one of the most hilariously harmless anomalous entities that the Foundation currently has in containment. Perhaps one day, he'll achieve his goal of conquering the universe. He just has to figure out how to conquer his toy box first. Hello again, dear viewers. You caught me during my break. But even researchers at the SCP Foundation need a little downtime now and then. And considering they revoked my playtime privileges with the living Lego and the nerfing gun after that unfortunate incident in the Site-19 break room, I've been downgraded to keeping myself occupied with this little rubber ball. I have a ball. Perhaps you'd like to bounce it, they say. Seems innocent enough, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, have you learned nothing? Almost any object, even something as innocuous as a teddy bear or a plastic paddling pool, can hide secrets. Sure, any avid basketball fan will happily tell you that ball is life, but sometimes when you're dealing with anomalies, a ball can also be death. Such is the case of SCP-018 also known as the Super Ball, an anomaly so powerful that the Foundation has even used it to help recontain SCP-682 during a breach. To the untrained observer, it really isn't much to look at. A small red rubber ball around 6 centimeters in diameter produced by the Whammo Company in 1969. Yeah, we were as surprised as you to find out that good old Dr. Wondertainment had nothing to do with this little number. You might also be surprised by just how extensive the containment procedures are for SCP-018. After all, it's rare that a completely non-sentient anomaly makes its way into the Euclid class. This little rubber ball is kept in a specially made titanium alloy metal restraint 
submerged in a dense polyethylene holding tank, filled with a special endothermic compound that draws the kinetic energy out of its surroundings. Anyone entering the chamber needs to wear a unique kind of reinforced plate armor, and if SCP-018 ever manages to escape its containment tank, nearby personnel are advised to treat it as they would an active shooter situation. Lock yourself in a nearby room, duck down below any cover you can find, and wait for armed containment units to show up and take control of the situation. At this point, you probably have a lot of questions. Chief among them being, why is this children's toy being given more security precautions than most serial killers? The ball was first discovered when a cleaning and disposal company was hired to empty out an old whammo warehouse of some defunct merchandise. One of the movers, Roy Fischler, embraced his inner child when he saw a red rubber ball sitting among all the dusty boxes of expired silly putty and broken remote control robots. He thought to himself, ah, oh, what's the harm in having a little fun here? It's all going in the trash anyway. This would prove to be a terrible mistake for all involved. The anomalous property of SCP-018 is the fact that it's able to bounce at 200% efficiency every time it's bounced, increasing at an exponential rate with each bounce unless it's stopped by some equivalent force. So when Roy decided to toss that little red ball onto the ground, he unleashed a destructive force into that warehouse that was more powerful than he could ever have imagined. With every bounce, the ball increased its height and speed, ricocheting across the floor, walls, and ceiling like a bullet run amok. And it was only just getting started. The workers hit the deck as the item that would later be dubbed SCP-018 decided to put the ball in ballistic. It smashed light fixtures, knocked over piles of boxes, smashed through forklifts. When one worker tried to catch it, it left a red-hot ball-shaped hole in the middle of his palm. It wasn't long before the ball had built up such speed that the warehouse could no longer contain it. It blasted out of the wall and rocketed into a nearby city, ready to cause more abject chaos wherever it went. Windows were shattered, streetlights were annihilated, cars crashed. Thankfully, no humans were killed by the rampaging rubber menace, but in total, five people were injured, and one unfortunate pigeon was utterly obliterated on impact. It went on for several days, with the ball reaching over 100 kilometers per hour at several points, before finally coming to a rest at a nearby lake, at which point it was retrieved by Foundation personnel. There were two silver linings to this incredibly strange anomalous incident. The first was, as previously alluded to, nobody actually died. The second was that, due to the incredible speeds at which SCP-018 moved, none of the civilian witnesses had any idea what they'd just encountered. As far as anomalous discoveries go, this was pretty much as close to a win as you can get. But for one ambitious researcher, it was far more than just a pleasingly non-violent initial containment story. It was a doorway to improving the Foundation's technology as a whole. Meet Dr. Brian Carella. He's what you might call a maverick, a blue sky thinker, always on his grind. The cornerstone of Dr. Carella's philosophy was that the Foundation should be making more active use of its benign anomalies to help track down and contain their more ornery foes. While everyone else around him seemed to only see a little rubber nuisance that was better locked away, Dr. Carella saw the immense potential in SCP-018, namely in providing a vital enhancement to another piece of Foundation technology, the SCP-A5 armor. It goes without saying that working for the SCP Foundation is an incredibly dangerous job, especially if you're part of one of the Foundation's myriad of mobile task forces. The hunt for anomalies can lead to all kinds of strange and inhospitable terrains. Before it was contained, SCP-096 was famously captured on an icy frozen tundra on top of a bleak mountain. Because of incidents like this, the Foundation had first invested money in the SCP-A5 tactical armor suit. Think of them like the Foundation's answer to the Iron Man suit. However, when dressed in several hundred pounds of reinforced metal, something important suffers along the way. Mobility. It isn't exactly easy to lug all that equipment around. And when an anomaly is heading for the hills at high speeds, being well defended doesn't count for much if you're already 10 miles behind the target in pursuit. This in Dr. Corella's mind was exactly where SCP-018 came into play. If that little red ball was built into the foot of an SCP-A5 armor suit, 
It could be used to bounce the operative wearing it to tremendous heights. This would allow them to not only give chase against fast-moving anomalies, but also cover difficult terrain and even scale great heights in a mere instant. But it wasn't just an increase to mobility that SCP-018 integration offered to the SCP-A5 suit. Picture this. With SCP-018 fused to the sole of the suit's reinforced metal foot, lending it 200% bouncing efficiency, it could unleash a deadly, concrete-shattering kick. The kind of thing that would leave you singing a falsetto for the rest of your life if you were lucky enough to survive it, if you know what I mean. To Dr. Corella, it was a match made in heaven. It could increase both the mobility and combat effectiveness of the suits by a considerable margin. And seeing as SCP-018 literally didn't have a mind of its own, there was no way it could suddenly go rogue during a mission and compromise everything, just as Abel had done during his stint as a mobile task force operator, before they ran out of targets for him and he started slaughtering his own comrades. Dr. Corella was so confident in the efficacy of this idea, he contacted the O5 Council personally to request approval for this little pet project. This approval was granted on a purely experimental basis. The technology would have to prove itself before being put into common use. It wasn't exactly what Corella wanted to hear, but it was a step in the right direction. He just needed the perfect opportunity to put them to the test. And then it came. SCP-682, the infamous hard-to-destroy reptile breach containment. It somehow adapted a cloaking ability and escaped further from the site it was being held at than ever before. The next time it was spotted was over two weeks later, causing pandemonium in the Amazon rainforest, devouring tribesmen and wrecking havoc on the local ecosystem. They needed to get on the scene fast and put that monster down before the damage it caused was irreparable and news of the beast in the Amazon leaked out into the local area. And thankfully, Dr. Corella had just the tool for the job. Field Agent Hammersmith was fitted with an SCP-A5 suit, complete with the SCP-018 enhancement in his dominant right leg. He was dispatched, and immediately the augmented suit began to show its efficacy. Agent Hammersmith bounded above the tree line at incredible speeds, using the HUD in the suit's mask to track the heat signature of SCP-682 moving among the trees below him. He'd been able to bind a tracking collar to the beast's neck during an earlier engagement, but now the true battle was on. His heart was pounding, adrenaline coursing through his veins, but he'd been ensured that even 682 would have a hard time tearing through his suit's armor. A commander directing him through an earpiece told him that now was the time to engage, before 682 detected his presence and began developing countermeasures. Dr. Corella was watching a live feed from the control room, confident that his 018 augmented suit would do the job. Following his orders to the letter, Hammersmith descended down onto 682 from above. However, before he could make contact, the reptile swiped him with its tail, sending his body sailing into a nearby tree. However, the suit stood firm. He felt the impact, but the actual damage was minimal. Now it was time for him to face off against the beast, one on one. He didn't have time to be afraid. As the beast descended upon him, fangs bared, he gave it a swift kick to the bottom jaw, tearing off half of its face. But anyone who knows SCP-682 would tell you that simply removing its bottom jaw wouldn't even slow 682 down. It was relentless, attacking Hammersmith with its fangs and jaws. It tore deep ruts into the suit's metal, but the suit was still managing to keep its occupants safe. Then Hammersmith struck back. Kick after kick, augmented by the 200% power of the Super Ball, slicing huge chunks from the reptile's body. He kicked in its chest, kicked off its limbs, and with a final mighty kick, even managed to bisect the beast in the middle. Of course, even that wouldn't keep it down for long, but with the hum of evacuation and containment helicopters rapidly approaching, Hammersmith breathed a sigh of relief. Back in the control room, everyone celebrated. Dr. Corella, most of all, vindicated in his belief that SCP-018 could save the day. And then Agent Hammersmith, without even thinking, rested his right foot on the floor just that little bit too firmly. The sudden bounce set Hammersmith a mile into the air. His foundation-trained composure evaporated. All he could do was scream as he blasted up into the clouds, then began to plummet. Back in the control room, everyone could see a live feed of Agent Hammersmith hurtling into a nearby lake and landing with an epic splash. While the regenerating remains of SCP-682 were contained and brought back into the nearest containment site, 
Another team was sent in to retrieve the heavily injured Agent Hammersmith. His medical examination afterward revealed that he'd suffered two broken legs, seven broken ribs, a missing arm, and a skull fracture. If he hadn't been wearing that suit, his mangled remains probably would have been devoured by the local piranhas by now. But despite that minor hiccup in the plan, Dr. Corella was still delighted with the results and immensely proud of the little red ball that could. In his closing remarks on the incident, he appended a final note to the SCP-018 file reading, Don't worry, it's fixed. But I have some more ideas. If I can be granted the use of some water from SCP-006 as well as some other SCPs, I can deliver you a set of SCP-A5 armor and an agent that can capture any, if not all, rogue or unattained SCPs. All I'm waiting on is your approval. Welcome to Planet Earth. She's got the toughest streets around, and if you're not careful, that mean old missy won't hesitate to wash out her gutters with your blood and decorate the sidewalks with your teeth. It's a tough world for the good and innocent, with the looming shadow of crime lurking around every corner, just waiting to prey on those who are unable to defend themselves. If you don't have the tools to survive, it'll chew you up and spit you out like a wad of stale chewing gum. That's why we need a hero, a dark defender, a cloak in the night. We need the Spectre. New Delhi, India. A woman walks home from her late-night job. She's exhausted. She can feel the bone-deep ache of 14 hours on a factory line, running herself ragged to support her three kids back home. She can barely stand. Can you really blame her for wanting to take the shortcut down that dark alley, knowing it'll shave 15 minutes off her trip? She ducks in, clutching her purse tight and keeping her head down, but it won't do any good. A predator has been lying in wait. He emerges from the darkness, wielding a huge knife, and grabs her by the shoulder. He's a few heads taller than her, with arms thicker than her neck. He tells her to hand over the money she'd spent all month working for, or he'd turn her kids into orphans. His knife had tasted blood before, and he'd have no problem killing again. With tears streaking down her face, knowing it's futile to resist, she reaches out and passes him the money. The bandit snatches it from her trembling hand and snickers, candy from a baby. He's ready to turn around and make a run with tonight's takings when he feels an odd chill drift into the alley. A soft whoosh. He turns and sees a figure standing and watching him. He's tall and well-built, with a long black coat and a wide-brimmed hat. He was darker than the dark. Light seemed to disappear into him, a black shape against the background. It's him, the man that all criminals know and fear all over the world. Even if they've never met him, the intrusive thought, the moment of creeping doubt that slithers into their minds, the second they even contemplate breaking the law, the bad guy's boogeyman. The Spectre. Halt, evildoer. The Spectre commands. You'll return this fine lady's money, or you'll suffer the consequences. The bandit feels a tremor of fear quiver through him, but he won't back down. Not yet. He charges the Spectre with his blade, slashing like a madman, but not a single hit lands. The Spectre weaves perfectly away from every strike and effortlessly disarms the bandit with a perfectly placed whack to the wrist. The knife clatters to the ground. He discombobulates the bandit with an open palm strike to either side of his head, then knocks him out with a laser-focused headbutt. He crumples to the ground unconscious, and the specter breathes a sigh. Another battle won. This whole time, the woman has been watching frozen in awe. The specter picks up her stolen money and hands it back to her with a gentlemanly doff of his wide-brimmed hat. He really is just darkness underneath, unseeable, unknowable, a living shadow. She thanks him, and he assures her that it's all in a day's work for a crime fighter like him. After all, somebody needs to do it. And in a flash of smoke, he's gone. The woman makes it home safely that night. London, England. A man lays beaten and bloody on the ground. Three assailants surround him, circling like hungry wolves. One wields a long lead pipe, still slick with the man's blood. Another a switchblade that he keeps clicking in and out of the handle. And the third carries a handgun, 
the same handgun he's used to take two lives before. The wounded man on the ground, with bruises, cuts, a broken ankle, a broken wrist, four broken ribs, and three missing teeth, is desperate and afraid. He's here because he was forced into a corner. He needed to borrow money from a dangerous man tucked away in a dingy building in London's East End, the city's organized crime epicenter. The money he'd borrow came with predatory interest that he couldn't pay back. Now he's paying the difference in blood to that same loan shark's violent goons. The man with the gun in a thick cockney accent tells him that this is why he shouldn't have messed around with Mr. Ford. Now he's going to be an example for anyone else stupid enough to think they can stiff the big man on a payment and live to tell the tale. He nods to the man with the pipe to finish the job. The beaten and bloodied man on the ground closes his eyes as the goon steps closer, lifting up the red-stained pipe and preparing to finally cave his pitiful head in with it. In the dark, he hears the whoosh of the pipe's downswing, and the breeze hits his bruised cheek, but the pipe never connects. Instead, there's a chorus of gasps. The man on the ground opens his eyes to get a better look at what on earth has happened. A tall, dark man in a long, black coat and a wide-brimmed hat is standing over him, holding the lead pipe that he just easily snatched from the hands of his previous user. The goons are all stepping back. The gunman raises his pistol, the other his knife. All of them look afraid. The man on the ground doesn't know the stranger who just saved his life, but in his presence, he feels something wash over him that he hasn't felt in a long while. Safety. It's him. It's the Spectre. You wretched villains, do you know better than to pick on the weak, a bunch of tough guys like you? How about fighting someone your own size? In a blind panic, the gunman raises his pistol and fires. The Spectre moves like smoke in the wind. He dodges the bullet and tosses the lead pipe. It sails through the air and hits the gunman's skull with an almighty crack. He collapses, dropping his weapon. The other two goons bumrush him, but it doesn't serve them any better. One slashes, the other punches. With a few skillful fluid movements, he guides one goon's knife-wielding hand into the other's shoulder, then disables both with a pair of simultaneous chops to the throat like that Jackie Chan himself would be proud of. All three goons are laid out on the ground, either writhing and gasping or knocked out cold. The Spectre straightens his coat and hat with practice finesse, and returns to the man laying on the ground. After checking that he was still alive and conscious, he passed the man a wad of cash and a phone, telling him to call an ambulance and get his wounds treated. None of those men would ever bother him again, and if they or any others dared to, then they could expect to see the dark figure of the Spectre appearing behind them in their bathroom mirror. After all, someone needs to be there to fight crime, even when nobody else will. New York City, USA. Things are going sideways at a major bank downtown. A group of well-armed, highly organized robbers has broken in. They've taken at least 50 hostages throughout the building and have informed the police blockade outside that unless their demands are met and they're given free passage out of the building, they'll start executing people left and right. And given the ruthless organization of this particular criminal crew, it seems more than likely that they'll put their blood money where their mouth is. Police squad cars form a horseshoe blockade around the building outside, armed with handguns, shotguns, and assault rifles. Police snipers are finding their ideal perches in the surrounding skyscrapers. SWAT is on the way and a police helicopter circles above. However, even if everything goes right, the higher-ups know that some fatalities are basically inevitable. Crews of hardcore career criminals like this wouldn't go down without a fight. One way or another, some lives would be taken today. Another transmission is delivered from the inside after that. The robbers know that time isn't on their side, so they're flipping the script. Five minutes, exactly. If their demands aren't met by then, blood would be staining the bank's immaculate marble floor. Tick tock. The negotiators on the front line are in a cold sweat. Five minutes? No, that isn't enough time! We can't mobilize, there'll be a massacre in there! How could ten greedy maniacs with assault rifles pull the rug out from under them all like this? Panicked thoughts swim through the head of a sergeant heading the blockade. He can't concede. His superiors would never allow it. 
Does he wait five minutes and see what happens? Or authorize his officers to breach the front doors, try to reclaim the bank, and potentially create one of the worst bank robbery bloodbaths in New York City history? Damned if he does, damned if he doesn't. And every second, the time to decide runs out. That's when he hears a soft whoosh behind him. Paranoid enough to jump at shadows, the sergeant turns reaching for his gun and sees what seems to be a dapper shadow standing right behind him. A tall man with a long black coat and a wide-brimmed hat. No face, just darkness itself under the shade of the brim. The stranger places a calm hand on his shoulder, and suddenly a sense of trust like he hasn't felt in years just sets in. Somehow deep in his marrow, he knows that this man is here to help. Rest assured, Sergeant, everything is under control now. For I, the Spectre, have arrived to save the day. How many criminals are inside? The Sergeant murmurs, Ten, in all. The Spectre nods. Worry not, Sergeant. Nobody will die today. And with that, like the ghost that is his very namesake, the Spectre is gone. Inside the bank, the leader of the robbers checks his watch. Two minutes, and still no word from the cops outside. He's starting to lose his patience. A few unfortunate bank tellers and customers crouch around him, their hands behind their heads. Five of his men are out here with him, armed and keeping the situation under control. The other four have cracked the security on the vault, and they're hauling out money by the bagful. And still silence from the cops. He sneers, and the thought crosses his mind that perhaps if he takes out a hostage or two now, the mooks out there might actually take his threats seriously. That thought amuses him. Oh. Yeah, that'll show them. They'll finally know who they're dealing with here. The leader shoulders his assault rifle and draws a bead on the hostages sitting closest to him. Even his men are shocked by the suddenness of it all, but they know better than to second-guess their boss at a time like this. He was always a little trigger-happy. The hostage, an older gentleman who'd only come into the bank to check his balance because he hadn't figured out how to do it online just yet, sees the gun and winces. He survived Nam and this was how he was going to go. Gunned down on a Wednesday afternoon by some creep for chump change. What a world. The leader's finger curls around the trigger, but before he can complete a squeeze, an expertly aimed fist collides with the back of his head, knocking him unconscious in a single strike. The leader collapses, his rifle sliding across the ground. The Spectre stands where he stood, straightening his coat and blowing dandruff off of his knuckles. Are you fellas ready to dance? He growls. He glides through them, moving with the grace of a prima ballerina and hitting with the force of a freight train. The goons are down before any of them can fire a single shot. With the help of some quick-thinking bank tellers, the Spectre closes the vault door from the outside, trapping the remaining four robbers inside. Textbook crime fighting once more. The bank customers and employees, weeping with joy and relief, thank the Spectre for saving their lives. He shakes his hand and assures them it was nothing, just doing what he could, as any concerned citizen should. He would have left after that, were it not for one little problem. The NYPD has a number of employees at different levels of their sprawling structure that are actually deeply embedded undercover agents of the SCP Foundation. And this isn't a comic book. There's a word for when a mysterious man made from darkness appears from nowhere and effortlessly takes down ten heavily armed, highly trained combatants by himself. And that word was anomalous. Knowing what this mysterious combatant was capable of, the Foundation sends some of their best mobile task force operatives to apprehend him, under the guise of just being standard SWAT team members sent in to get the situation back under control in the aftermath of the robbery. However, much to their extreme surprise, the Spectre puts up absolutely no resistance to them. He understands that the men here to apprehend him are servants of law and order, and would not defy their will, but he pleads with them to reconsider. You don't understand, sirs. You're making a huge mistake, he says distraught. I'm here to help. I'm the Spectre, defender of the innocent, scourge of the evildoer. You can't lock me away. You can't. The people need me. As tragic as it is to see a genuinely benevolent anomaly beg for his freedom, the mobile task force's hearts have long since hardened to this kind of thing. He wouldn't be the first sapient humanoid anomaly to speedrun all seven stages of grief on their knees in front of them. 
and he probably wouldn't be the last. Foundation protocol is to tag and bag either way, even if they just use their anomalous abilities to thwart a bank robbery. The Spectre is hauled back to the nearest Foundation containment site and held in a holding cell while researchers prepare to conduct initial tests and questioning. Everything seems so run-of-the-mill. Little do they notice, something extremely strange is starting to happen to New York City beyond the containment chamber's walls. They're about to learn the true, devastating consequences of keeping a pure force of good like the Spectre locked up. Like a switch has been flipped, nearby police suddenly become oddly listless. Instead of working, they just chat with each other and random citizens about the weather. Some watch SCP Explained on their phone while active robberies are happening. A man is mugged right in front of a squad car and the cop inside just listens to his Van Halen CDs at max volume. In actual precincts, the on-duty cops start to wonder why on earth they're actually here. In this building, all together, listening to phone calls from weirdly panicked people and typing up reports on… stuff? It all just seems oddly confusing. They decide to go outside and watch clouds or go home and play video games. It doesn't make any sense that they're just standing around in here, doing nothing for no reason. Across the city, strange incidents start to occur. People who so much as knock into each other while walking on the crowded New York streets begin to brawl with one another on the ground, while nobody around them even really acknowledges that they're doing it, let alone tries to break them up. Nearby, cars crash at the intersection, and rather than getting out to exchange insurance information, the irate drivers draw guns and start to duel like bit characters in an old cowboy movie. Nobody really seems to mind. As if noticing a change in the wind, organized crime rackets decide that secrecy isn't the way to go anymore. Mob enforcers rob stores and shake down random people in the streets, taking wallets, watches, phones, and jewelry. Criminals break into people's homes and start ransacking the place, stealing everything from flat screen TVs to priceless family heirlooms, while their owners sit on the couch, seemingly unable to even comprehend that something is going wrong here. But everything is still about to get a whole lot worse. The city breaks into riots and looting, people battling in the streets. News helicopters circle above, reporting the chaos unfolding below them, but they do so with an odd kind of detached calm, not really comprehending the full scope of what's happening or why. Just that a whole lot more is on fire now than it was before. How strange. This is the moment when the SCP Foundation realizes the meaning of the Spectre's pleading. He really was being entirely unselfish, because you see, the Spectre isn't just an extremely devoted crime fighter. He's the very personification of the concept of fighting crime. He can't ever be locked up or contained, because if you do, then the very concept of resisting crime fades from the human consciousness. Order ceases to be, and chaos reigns. That's why the Spectre, also known as SCP-4494, is classified as Archon, meaning that he can't be contained because the danger of containing him would be far greater than the danger of letting him roam around and do his thing unhindered. He maintains an amicable relationship with the SCP Foundation after everything that happened, willing to swoop in and help their agents when they're in a bind and need a little hand from a true hero. And when he's not fighting crime, he relaxes in the Spectre Cave by watching TV and playing video games. No, we're not making that up. Unsurprisingly, his favorite video games are the ones where you get to play as superheroes, though he will occasionally indulge in some Grand Theft Auto V. Just don't expect him to break any traffic laws while he's playing, thank you very much. So if ever you feel afraid, or if the dark forces that are all too human in this world are marshalling against you, know this, you don't fight alone. There's a man in the shadows, ready to come to your aid. He's a warrior for justice. He's a defender of the innocent, but most of all, he is the Spectre. Oh god, oh god, I'm trapped in the infinite Ikea. How long have I been in here? Can I get out? How can I get out? How can I survive the vicious staff of the infinite Ikea and work with the other survivors in this terrifying endless building? Okay, let's start from the beginning. Day one, 
I'd come to this flat pack nightmare with my lovely wife, Brenda, to pick up some stupid sofa she saw online. We could have ordered it in, but me being a cheapskate and a fool, instead decided it'd be a dandy idea to head in and pick it up ourselves, even though I can't stand shopping in these giant stores. Of course, it didn't take long for us to get separated. I was wandering around, just pretending I knew what I was doing, surrounded by unfamiliar people. Then, not surrounded by any people at all. Like the complete doofus I was, I'd somehow gotten lost. Just needed to find my bearings again, and then I could call Brenda to come save me. But I never did find my bearings. The hours went on, and I was still lost. Day two. My dominant emotion on this day was nothing more than sheer humiliation. Knowing I had been bested by a damn Swedish furniture store. I spent the night before sleeping on a futon, wondering how I'd gotten myself into this flat pack calamity. I spent the day searching for food, my confusion and exhaustion increasing by the moment. For a while, I even entertained the idea that I might have died and gone to some Nordic hell. That night, I went to bed hungry, knowing if I didn't eat soon, I might be found as a skeleton on a dusty old futon. God, it came in like this. I can't die on day two. Day three. I continued my journey through the labyrinthian bowels of the Ikea, disoriented by the endlessly iterating collections of cheap furniture. You know, there was something terrifying about the emptiness of it all. This affordable but impossible to assemble void. Starvation has always been one of the most horrific deaths, hasn't it? You could only imagine my relief when I saw the figure standing a few feet in front of me, dressed like a member of Ikea staff. I'd found salvation! I'd found someone who could help me out of here! But when I approached, I realized something was horribly wrong. This wasn't a human being standing before me. It was a monster. The being I'd later come to know is called the Staff by the many people who fear them. It chased me, repeating, The store is closed, you need to vacate the premises, flailing for me with its long, frightening limbs. I only survived day three because I locked myself in a closet and just waited while it hammered against the wood with its fists. Once the night was over, it left and I was able to escape. Day four. I was feeling some intense hunger pangs on this day. Not to mention the fact that I now knew there were monsters out there just waiting to beat me to death if they caught me when the lights turned down. Needless to say, I wasn't in the best headspace, and I didn't have enough charge on my phone to justify opening up my meditation app. Then, I found Nirvana. I found the cafeteria, stocked full of delicious, warm Swedish meatballs. You know, no food has ever tasted so sweet to me. Then this delicious meal also gave way to one of the most exciting new developments, Gloria. Gloria was a veteran. She taught me everything I needed to know about this place. Even on the first day I met her, she felt like someone I'd known for years. It was her that took me back to her home in this place. A little fortress made of Ikea furniture filled with a whole community of other people trapped in there. It was like being allowed into the Garden of Eden. Day five, and it feels good to be alive. I met up with all the different people around the camp. They tell me the most bizarre and fascinating stories. Uh, this sounds crazy, I know, but I get the sense not all of them came from the same place as me. Different Ikeas in different countries, or maybe even as nutty as it sounds, from different worlds. One guy, Tony, who's been trapped in here for a year and some change, we got to talking about different vacations we'd taken on the outside. He told me he was from New York, and I told him I visited there once, and I'd love going to see the Statue of Liberty up close. That's when he told me that he'd never heard of the Statue of Liberty. You know, I didn't know what to make of that. Strange little details aside, I couldn't be happier to be there with other people. The next step would be finding a way out of here, and back to Brenda. Day 6. Gloria and several others led me out on our first excursion. Missions where the goal was to collect more food and supplies and map out the surrounding area. I nearly jumped out of my skin when I saw a staff member standing in our path at one point, and the others all just laughed at me. The staff member just stood there, placid and still. Gloria told me that it's okay. The staff are harmless during the day. It's only nighttime when they enter their pattern of aggression. So long as you don't get lost during the daytime, you're generally fine. The team often use strength, like thesis, to trail behind them and ensure they don't get lost. It was clear they'd been here long enough to work out systems for every possibility. Felt like I was in good hands with them. We collected meatballs and some rugs to fortify the walls and headed back. Day 7. This was the first night that we had to fend off a full-on attack. Those monsters. The staff came at us in huge groups, pounding at the outside of our perimeter with their bald fists. It was terrifying. 
As we were fighting them off, we tied IKEA kitchen knives to the end of curtain rails and speared them, one by one, until all of them were dead. <sighs> they just kept coming. More and more and more of them. When it looked like one of the walls to the north of the community was going to fall, everyone around me started to panic. That's when Barry, one of the biggest men in the camp, grabbed a hammer in each hand and went outside. He fought like a beast, taking on staff member after staff member, tanking hit after hit. It was something to see. That's when he took off into the depths of the store, drawing the staff away behind him, saving us all. We never saw Barry again after that, but he's the reason all of us made it past day seven. Thank you, Barry, wherever you are. Day eight. Gloria took me out alone today, on another search for the escape. That's when she told me about her sister. She'd gone shopping in Ikea with her well over a year ago now, when she was separated and got lost in here, just like me. I had a lot in common with her, including my feelings of guilt for abandoning my loved ones and my drive to escape and be united with them. While we were out that day, we didn't find anything useful. Gloria seemed sad, but unsurprised. The infinite Ikea had its way of slowly grinding you down. Days nine to day 17. Despite a rocky start, I was finding my legs in the infinite Ikea. I started to get to know my fellow Ikea prisoners. I started to understand and truly befriend them. We went on expeditions pretty much daily, either to collect new food, more supplies to help build up our community, or to keep searching for an exit. To me, it started to feel like we were making progress, and that helped a great deal to keep my emotions semi-stable. But it wasn't the same for Gloria. After all, she'd been here for so much longer than me, and she had her sister to consider on the outside. To her, these routines I was becoming part of now felt like a prison within a prison. She was trapped. Had her sister forgotten her out there? Had she been declared dead? Were people even still looking for her? And it was on day 18 that it all got a little too much for poor Gloria. She snuck out of the camp at night, when the staff were most active trying to find the exit. Sadly, that had cost Gloria her life. There's no way of knowing what happened to her exactly, but considering how bruised up her body was when we found her, it was easy to make an educated guess. She'd gotten bum-rushed by the staff and beaten to death before she could have even mustered up a defense. It was a horrible way to go. We tried giving her a dignified funeral as we could, given the circumstances, closing her up in a body-sized box. That was the day I decided to stop just trying to survive and start trying to escape. I owe that to Brenda. If she really had gotten out, I couldn't keep her waiting. But I wouldn't be alone. As it turns out, another two members of the little Ikea community I'd come to know were willing to risk it all with me. A man named Kelvin and a young woman named Vicky. They were sick of just waiting around and fending off attacks from the staff night after night. They both told me they'd rather die during an escape attempt than while cowering under a pile of cheap rugs. And so, each armed with claw hammers from the six-piece Ikea Fixa toolkit and as many Prutha Tupperware containers full of meatballs that we could carry, we set off into the great unknown of Ikea. We traveled for weeks, marking our tracks on the ground with the Mala Mixed Colors chalk selection so we never got caught going in circles. One day bled into the next. Nights were spent trying to hide in closets and bathtubs while the staff hunted relentlessly for people just like us. Every single time, we got lucky. That is, until day 41. Here's something you need to know about the infinite Ikea. You're probably already aware, if you're watching this, that the 24-hour cycle of night and day is dictated by the store lights up above. But the space between day and night isn't a gradient here. It's a cliff. You can be minding your own business when suddenly, hitch darkness, and now the staff are on your ass. That's exactly what happened on day 41. We're in the middle of a kitchenware selection, surrounded by a few docile members of staff, when suddenly, the lights switched off, and they went hostile on us. They look pretty goofy after the initial shock has worn off, but believe me when I say that these monsters can really pack a mean wallop when they want to. And we received a reminder of this unfortunate fact that night. The staff swarmed us, repeating that awful phrase, the store is closed, you need to vacate the premises, while they struck and flailed at us. If it wasn't for our trusty claw hammers, we would have been dead that night. Thankfully, we were able to give better than we were getting. We managed to kill a decent number of staff members, and then make a run for a section with better hiding places. Myself, Vicky, and Kelvin all stowed away in a large wardrobe, until we saw light flickering through the crack in the door, like we were rejected extras for some painful community theater take on the Chronicles of Narnia. But while we survived that night, we didn't survive unscathed. 
My face was swollen from a nasty punch one of the staff members dealt me, and from the pain in my chest, I might have been dealing with a few broken ribs. Kelvin sprained his ankle during the escape, and Vicky had a cut on her forehead from when one of the staff members kneed her in the face during the fray. You never win these fights, you just survive them. We made a temporary camp in the area where we could rest and recover, as well as shaking off the justifiable fear of death or grievous harm that dampened our resolve to get out of this place. That took us to day 53. Of course, food was always a concern. I don't want to romanticize what happened in there, as much as I'm sure someone on the outside might want to imagine this whole experience as some kind of exciting survival horror game, but I assure you, it was less survival horror and more survival and horror meaning not only are we suffering from constant fear, stress, and paranoia for our safety in here, but we also need to keep ourselves fed and watered. You're just as likely to die from starvation in here as you are to be beaten to death. We went in search of another IKEA kitchen where we could fill up on more water and meatballs, your lifeblood in a place like this. It took us several more days of searching and hiding, searching and hiding, before we hit pay dirt. By the time we actually got our hands on the food and water, we were starving and practically coughing up dust. Those meatballs were the most delicious food I've ever tasted, and I could tell from their faces that Kelvin and Vicky felt exactly the same way. Though, at the moment, I told myself if, no, when I get out of here, I'd never eat another meatball. It'd probably give me war flashbacks, or I guess, store flashbacks? We filled up our Tupperware and shoved them back into our Kia proving backpacks. Then we needed to keep moving, keep searching, and keep marking the ground behind us as we fanned out into the great flat pack yonder, avoiding confrontations wherever we could. The three of us still had no idea what insanity was waiting for us out there. We had no idea that there were even more dangerous things than the staff lurking in the shadows. Day 68. Of course I kept count, writing it down on the back of my jet lake coloring book. Trust me, when every night could mean a horrible death, you keep track of the nights. Not a single one of them escapes you. At a certain point, I think we all adapted in our own way. It was back to caveman times again, learning to be like our primal ancestors, hiding away from the dark and the monsters that hid there. So it was extremely surprising for us to get the most brutal attack during the day. At first, I thought we were being attacked by the staff during daylight hours, like a bolt from the blue. That's when we noticed they weren't attacking with their hands. They were all holding kitchen knives, holding us up like bandits. That's when we realized what had actually happened here. We weren't being attacked by the staff. We were being attacked by other humans dressed like the staff, wearing their hollowed out heads like grisly masks. They told us that we were coming with them, and if we resisted, they'd cut us to ribbons. And seeing as none of us were movie action heroes, we thought it'd be best to do exactly what they said. This is how we fell into the clutches of Generalissimo Vardagen. Day 69. But things were not nice. I mean, I get it. Yeah, ha, huh, funny, nice. I don't know if I'd mentioned this before, but the community I became part of in the Infinite Ikea after meeting Gloria was just one of many. Nobody knows exactly how many people are trapped in here. I'm hardly a martyr for spending 68 days in there. I know people who've been trapped in there for years, who've given all hope of escape and accepted their lot in life. They became the elders of a lot of these communities, helping others adjust. Though... Of course, Generalissimo Vartagen was not one of these people. Myself, Vicky, and Kelvin were dragged by the strangers dressed as staff members into a fort made of smashed up wood nailed together into a huge, ominous structure. It was a far more extensive structure than any of the communities I'd visited or even heard about before in the infinite Ikea. It was a true fortress, guarded by many more of those knife-wielding people dressed in the clothes and in the flesh of the staff. It looked like some evil cult straight out of a damn horror movie. I had never seen anything like it. We were dragged into a kind of tent in the middle of the camp, made out of stitched together rugs. That's where we met Generalissimo Vardagen, surrounded by his guards. I'd later learn his namesake was a set of steak knives stocked in the IKEA kitchenware sections, similar to the knives being wielded by his gallery of goons. The Generalissimo himself was dressed like some absurd tin pot dictator, wearing a silly hat and a jacket covered in fake medals. His whole presence felt like a cosmic punishment for daring to believe things couldn't get any more absurd than they already were. His men forced us down onto our knees, and Vardagen cleared his throat to speak. Quake interferes the sight of this IKEA's ruler. 
the great and powerful Generalissimo Vardagen. I have united kingdoms from the gardening and bathroom supplies departments and crushed dissenting tribes in the office furniture sections to the west. If you wish to live, you will swear fealty to me and join my legion of servants. If you do as I say, you will be given safety and security from the staff come nightfall. If you do not bend the knee, I will have you destroyed! By the time his little spiel was done, the man was red in the face and sweating profusely. It was clear that, much like your average IKEA shelving unit after a couple weeks of use, the great Generalissimo Vardagen had a few screws loose. None of us liked the idea of becoming slaves to some flat-packed Genghis Khan, so we tried to persuade him to just let us go, telling him that we hoped to escape the store, and with our help, he could escape too. That's when we learned a sobering lesson. For some people, life inside the infinite Ikea was better than life outside. In the real world, the Generalissimo had been a twice-divorced ex-salary man with nothing to his name but debts and regrets. But here, he was a demigod, a leader among the rest of us mere mortals. Why would he ever want to go back to the world that had given him nothing and taken everything? Day 70 to Day 84. We were forced into weeks of hard labor after that toiling under the Generalissimo and his gang of brigands. The soldiers worked us like dogs, making us carry food and furniture back to the Generalissimo's Scandinavian furniture fortress. One day bled into the next. The best I could say about any of this was at least we were safe behind the walls of the fortress at night, so we didn't need to worry about getting murdered by the staff in our sleep. However, tragedy struck again on day 85. Kelvin couldn't take the work anymore. One day, I think his mind just snapped. He refused to follow orders from the Generalissimo and his lieutenants, even when they threatened him with death. Sadly, that night they would prove that this wasn't just some empty threat. When night fell, they tied up Kelvin's arms and legs and left him outside the fortress. We were just forced to watch as the staff assembled and beat our friend to death while he lay there, unable to defend himself. Even in all the time I'd spent in the infinite Ikea, that was the most harrowing thing I'd ever seen. But in one of the few acts of righteous cosmic justice that we'd seen since being trapped in here all those months ago, just a few days after Kelvin's brutal execution, Day 90, the day of the revolution. While I'd love to tell you that I started this, there are no heroes in this story. I just happened to be the one telling you about it. Some internal conflict between the Generalissimo and his men boiled over into a kind of civil war that tore the fortress apart from within. Vicky and I escaped, but in different directions. I'd like to imagine she got out in the end. It helps me sleep at night. But one thing I will tell you, Generalissimo Vardagen found out what happened to tyrants, big and small, when his closest confidants give him the Julius Caesar treatment with the knives from which he took his name. I don't think there's anything wrong in taking a little joy in that. For days afterwards, I just walked. I felt so empty, but I refused to just lay down and let myself die. Even though so much of the hope had been beaten out of me, I couldn't betray Brenda by just giving up in here. It wouldn't be right. It just wouldn't be right. The days ticked on and nothing changed. I had no food, no weapons, and I was getting so tired. Then night fell, and the staff started chasing me. They seemed even more aggressive than before. I couldn't fight. All I could do was run. I ran, and I ran, and I ran, not even looking where I was going as the crowd of staff started catching up with me. Getting closer and closer, I ran until there was a doorway before me. I didn't even think. I just was trying to get away. That's when I noticed that the store's roof was no longer above me. For the first time in 100 days, I was once again tasting fresh air. That's right, folks. On day 100, I was out. I truly made it out. This victory, however, was short-lived. A group of about six staff members burst out of the front door behind me, charging towards me with ferocious speed. I couldn't move, all I could do was grit my teeth and wince, ready to accept my death at what had otherwise been the high point of my recent life. What a depressing irony that would be. But instead, gunshots rang out through the air. A hail of bullets cleaved through the staff members, dropping them to the ground mere feet away from me, stone dead. That's when I turned to see a group of men with assault rifles and tactical gear walking towards me. In any other situation, this might have been terrifying, but right then, it was the happiest moment of my life. These men took me away from the parking lot of what is now an abandoned Ikea. They told me they were from a group called the SCP Foundation, and that I'd been declared missing for some time now. I didn't care about any of that. I just asked them if Brenda had gotten out. 
If she hadn't escaped too, then this was all for nothing. You can't even imagine my relief when they told me that Brenda was never even trapped. She was the one who reported my disappearance after I dropped off the face of the earth in what she thought was a perfectly normal IKEA shopping session, before that building was shut down and cordoned off under some less insane pretense. But Brenda was alive and safe, and I'd get to be with her again. I have no shame in telling you I cried, but I'd like to specify that they were absolutely tears of joy. The men from the SCP Foundation told me that they'd give me a medicine that had helped me forget all this after I told them my story, and there's no part of me that has a problem with that. Some things are better left forgotten. But before the SCP Foundation wipes it all away from my mind and I get to go live with my beloved wife once more, this was how I survived 100 <laughs> dreadful days in the infinite Ikea. Agent Kister was running for his life. Every breath had burned in his throat, like inhaling chlorine gas. He sped through the dark, surrounded by deafening metallic screams that bounced off the eternity of pipes scaling and strangling the walls around him. As far as he was concerned, this was what hell looked like. A nightmare boiler room that would somehow be less scary if Freddy Krueger was there, because at least there'd be some kind of recognizably human intelligence to reason with. The pipes, SCP-015, are truly unknowable. As an SCP Foundation Mobile Task Force member, Agent Kister had seen some truly horrific things in the line of duty. He'd been there during SCP-682 containment breaches, firing an assault rifle at the beast as its scales hardened into a bulletproof carapace. He'd seen the femur breaker used on some poor, godforsaken D-Class to lure Uncle Larry back into the containment chamber for some midnight fun. In the most anxiety-inducing mission of his life, he'd once even bagged 096's weeping face after it slaughtered a whole mountain village. And these damn pipes were going to be the thing that killed him. He turned a sharp corner, trying to block out the screams of his teammates. Four of them had been sent in. The rest were already dead, or worse. Stupid, stupid, stupid. They'd made a classic military mistake, underestimating the capabilities of their enemy. And in Agent Kister's experience, this had always been a capital offense. All to install that machine. That stupid little remote control reconnaissance vehicle. That's what they'd given their lives for. Agent Kister tried to blink away the memory of Agent Montgomery's face. Monty was the youngest member of the team, 28 years old, his first major mission into the heart of a skip. Kister wanted to remember him how he'd first seen him, a bright-eyed greenhorn, ready to protect the human race from the horrors that lay in the dark. But he'd been the first to go when everything got F-U-B-A-R. It was the smaller pipes that got Monty. Four of them shot out, spearing his lungs and heart, pinning him in place. Even if they tried to cut him out, he would have been a goner. He coughed up blood and went ghost white faster than you'd ever imagine. Kister would never forget, for what little time he had left to live, the horrible sight of the light leaving that kid's eyes. And all this because one of them had tripped on one of the pipes on the way out and busted it. The mission was already done. What an awful, pointless way to die. Kister was yanked from his aching thoughts by a sudden obstacle in the way. A huge, towering pipe that looked like a pillar of flesh covered in bulbous, staring eyes. The thought crossed his mind. Jesus, these pipes can really be made out of anything. He looked down and saw a series of rubber pipes slithering towards his feet along the ground like snakes. It was time to run again, but how long could you even run for when the very location around you wants you dead? They should have sent the mole rats for a job like this. The infinitely reconfiguring pipes changed the layout of the warehouse around him, making escape seem all the more unfeasible. That's when he started thinking about the terrible thing that happened to Agent Green. When 015 turned hostile, they needed to make a run for it fast. It wasn't unlike being a pathogen inside a living body. You start to make trouble, and the body's immune system is going to come for you. And one of the most common mechanisms for a body fighting a virus is a fever. A sudden increase in temperature that burns out the threat. The group turned and ran as the pipes started twisting towards them. Agent Green panicked and began striking at the pipes around him with his hands. The first instinct would have been to shoot, but no guns were permitted inside the SCP-015 warehouse. It reacted severely to any kind of tool being brought into its proximity. 
Several dead agents and researchers could tell you all about this if they hadn't made that same mistake. But when things were already going sideways, it left them defenseless. Agent Green was soon boxed in, caged by a latticework of pipes in varying sizes. He tried desperately to push them out of the way and make an escape route, but the hissing noise was getting louder and louder as the pipes started to turn a glowing red all around him. After all, when a body needs to deal with a hostile foreign object, it burns out the threat. Kister wished he could shake the awful, high-pitched wail that Agent Green made while the heat inside his pipe cage became unbearable. It was like seeing a human get caught inside a giant bug zapper. His skin went black and charred, and soon after, the heat had risen to such an insane degree that Agent Green was reduced to little more than ash in his pipe furnace. But Kister couldn't afford to dwell. He kept running, vaulting over a long, ragged pipe made from stinking human hair. This terrible place stank of motor oil, mold, and death. But maybe those perceptions had been colored by the terrible things he'd seen here. There it was again, that awful choked screaming coming from inside the pipes. Agent Boggs. It was a nightmare to hear him shriek like that. Boggs had been one of the toughest men that Kister had ever met. He mentored him, back when he first became an MTF member. Having Boggs on the team meant experience. It meant safety. It meant that things would go okay. Kister had seen Boggs stare down some of the most horrifying skips imaginable and not even flinch. And yet, here he was, screaming and bawling like a hurt child in the pipes. Boggs was the next one to get taken. As he and Kister ran through the dark, trying to find a way out, they'd passed a huge pipe made of a soft, foam-like substance. A seam in the side of the pipe had yawned open, and a tangle of writhing tentacles, each one barbed with thorns like the stem of a rose bush. They enveloped Agent Boggs, cutting into his weathered skin. He gasped in pain, unable to scream. It happened so fast. Before Kister even had a chance to grab him, he was pulled into the pipe, and the crevice sealed behind him. And that was when the screaming really started for poor Agent Boggs. Kister hoped for his sake, that he would die sometime soon. Shrouded in the fog of his dark thoughts, Agent Kister turned a corner and felt cold, hard metal suddenly collide with his face, breaking his nose with an unpleasant crunch. He'd been clotheslined by a low pipe that hadn't been there before, and now he was laid out on his back, face humming with pain. Thoughts and feelings swam. He looked up into the seemingly infinite web of pipes weaving through the air above him. He was right earlier. He just knew it. The place was hell. It'd be his eternal resting place. Suddenly, a new huge shape moved into the space above him. A pipe of ancient, rusty iron that looked older than even the warehouse holding this whole mess. Right above him, there was a huge valve fixed into the pipe's belly. He watched helpless as the valve opened itself with a squeal, and a huge dark mass came pouring out of it onto his body. A sudden weight, a sudden warmth, Sound and movement, and tiny scratching claws. Rats. Thousands of big, hungry black rats with gnarled yellow teeth. Clumps of fur purge from their skin by mange. Big, ropey, worm-like tails swaying and whipping at the air. Who knows how long they'd been in that pipe. Who knows when these rats had eaten anything that wasn't their brothers and sisters. And here was Agent Kister, given unto them by the glorious pipes. The last thing he ever saw were those nasty yellow teeth, because they ate his eyes first. Word of the four disappeared, and presumed dead operatives soon reached Dr. Charles Ogden Gears, the legendarily tacturned senior researcher that managed the SCP-015 project, among a myriad of others. His face didn't betray a flicker of emotion when he was informed about the men lost to SCP-015. It wasn't that he didn't feel for them, more that he deemed it both unproductive and unprofessional to dwell on the deaths of personnel when carrying out their duties. After all, being killed by an anomaly was simply an occupational hazard, and a generous stipend would be sent to their families to compensate for their tragic loss. Dr. Gears simply asked, Was the mission successful in spite of the casualties? Did the team manage to install the modular robotic vehicle at the epicenter? He was told that the MRV had been successfully installed, at least. Dr. Gears nodded and began scheduling a second exploratory mission for a few months in the future to check the status of the machine. 
Still, in the meantime, the MRV would chug along, doing what humans couldn't, or perhaps shouldn't, do within the nightmarish mess of ever-growing pipes. It would roll through, collecting information on everything around it, hopefully giving the SCP Foundation an inroad to mapping the whole thing, without needing to send a cavalcade of staff into the danger zone, just to discover more about these peculiar pipes. Sure, some lives were lost getting in there, but this measure would likely save even more lives in the long run. That was… until something went wrong. The exact nature of what happened to the MRV inside the Domain of Pipes was a mystery, but it wasn't doing its intended job, and the SCP Foundation needed to find out why. The second exploratory mission was required much sooner than they'd initially anticipated, with a dual purpose, collecting the readings and finding out what exactly had happened to the MRV in the first place. He included a more specific set of instructions for the next mission. Only three members of personnel to enter SCP-015 this time, to minimize potential loss. One trained technician to collect and read the diagnostics, and two guards to maintain discipline and safety under pressure. With a setup like that, what could possibly go wrong? Dr. Gears' various assistants began headhunting the perfect team for the job. Junior researcher Lon, wanting to prove herself and climb up the ranks, put her name forward. She was young, intelligent, and had the initiative to get the job done. Though there was one thing that she hadn't disclosed when she was applying for this important new position. Junior researcher Lon suffered from claustrophobia, the fear of enclosed spaces. Then the hunt was on for the two members of Foundation military personnel who'd escort Lon to the MRV to take the readings. Like the two priests in The Exorcist, they decided to recruit one grizzled, experienced operative and one extremely cautious young buck straight out of the Foundation MTF Training Academy. The younger of the two operatives, codenamed Agent 2, was careful and conscientious to a fault. He did things by the book, or not at all. The older operative, codenamed Agent 6, was quite the opposite. He'd done this job long enough to operate solely on instinct, and resented his employers for expecting him to approach his missions any other way. Lon, Agent 2, and Agent 6. The team was assembled, and when the time came, they were taken to SCP-015 to execute their mission. It should have been simple enough. Get in, collect the readings, and get back out. Though a few weeks earlier, the same thing would have been said for the mission to install the MRV, which left for mobile task force operatives dead or worse. Nothing was ever as simple as it seemed when it came to SCP-015. They were only allowed flashlights inside. Anything else carried a substantial risk of activating SCP-015's defensive state, putting all of their lives in jeopardy. Lon had tried to keep things light, masking her own terrible fear at this strange new situation. She joked that perhaps the three of them should get Mario hats, seeing as they were plumbers now. Agent 2 happily laughed along, suggesting that perhaps he should be Luigi. Agent 6 was utterly unamused by this whole situation and wanted no part of it, which is honestly just so Wario of him. They followed along a carefully mapped route through the pipes, being careful not to touch any of them. After all, you never know what could set SCP-015 off. Agent 6 didn't share in their merriment or their concern. In fact, he had contempt for them and this whole situation. He thought Lon and Agent 2 were a pair of frightened, skittish children, willing to buy whatever Foundation-assigned bull honky they were given. He didn't believe that SCP-015 was anywhere near as dangerous as they'd been told. In all likelihood, knowing the eggheads up top, they just didn't want men of action like him breaking any of their precious little toys while conducting missions on their behalf. This whole thing was a big, stupid joke. As they ducked and weaved through the confines of SCP-015, the tensions between them all just silently grew. Their flashlights played among the pipes, revealing the insane variety of shapes, sizes, compositions, and materials in here. Wood, steel, flesh, bone, glass, pressed ash, granite, and so much more. And yet, there were no pipes comprised of any standard pipe-making material like lead, PVC plastic, or copper. It was undeniably freaky, but when you work with SCPs for long enough, 
you learn to stop asking questions about the more minor forms of strangeness inherent to anomalies. The composition only got narrower as they delved deeper into the warehouse. Lon felt the anxiety, like a hand gripping her throat and squeezing, but tried still to keep it hidden. Agent Six, the largest among them, almost got stuck a few times, trying to crawl into spaces too tight for him to fit. He felt like murdering Lon when she threw out a casual comparison to Winnie the Pooh in the process. When they reached the MRV, it gave them an ounce of momentary relief. The journey was halfway done. But the comfort was quickly squashed by seeing what had actually happened to the MRV. It had been speared by a pipe, and new pipes had grown through and out of it, effectively rooting it in place. This caused immediate debate among the group around one key issue. Did this mean that the MRV was now technically part of the pipes? And by extension, would the pipes feel the need to defend themselves if the data banks were removed from the MRV in order to deliver the readings back to the researchers at Site 17? While Lon and Agent 2 carefully discussed the issue, Agent 6 lost his temper and decided to show these two foolish kids how it was done. He claimed the two of them were worrying about a bunch of Foundation hooey that they were inexperienced and gullible enough to believe, as if this bunch of weird pipes was actually dangerous. It was like how every six anomalies there's apparently one capable of ending the world. It's all a bunch of overblown, fear-mongering nonsense. And to prove that he wasn't just all talk on this front, Agent Six pried open the top of the MRV and slid out the data cards which seemed to be covered in some kind of viscous, unpleasant liquid from the pipes that had penetrated the device. Still, he'd gotten what they came for. He could have done this whole thing alone without this pair of bedwetters. He scoffed and said, Kids, I don't know how you two survive. But he shouldn't have spoken so soon. The large pipe that he didn't even realize he was standing on opened up beneath his feet, and seconds later he was immersed up to his shoulders in it. Six began to let out the most horrifying shrieks you've ever heard, and when Agent 2 and Lon ran over to try and help him out, they realized why. The pipe below Agent 6 was filled with flowing molten iron. By the time they pulled Agent 6 out, well, Agent 6 from the shoulders up, considering that that was all that was left, he was already dead. And despite the actual aggressor being destroyed, SCP-015 wasn't done. It was ready to clean house. As Agent 2 and Lon attempted to flee, some eye-level pipes around them burst, firing crystallized glass into their faces, cutting into their skin and eyes. But they needed to push on, despite the pain if they wanted to survive and get out. The two of them ran, horrifying noises of twisting and bursting pipes roaring behind them. Pipes made of thorns and bones started to grow, blocking off their exits until they were trapped. Lon, utilizing her small frame, was able to crawl through a gap in the pipes into an adjoining chamber. Two was given a horrifying surprise when a pipe burst near his hand, showering his flesh in thick, corrosive gunk. His hand melted away at the wrist. As Lon called for help in the tiny cramped chamber she was locked in, Two ran off to try and find an exit where he could bring more people in to help them but it would already be too late for poor Lon. A thick, honey-like substance began bleeding into the chamber, disgusting in its overpowering saccharine flavor and goopy, viscous thickness. The chamber seemed to get smaller and smaller as Lon screamed as the honey level rose. Eventually, it got higher than her mouth and nose could reach. She gave a horrifying final gurgle, and then she was gone, entombed forever between the pipes. Agent 2 kept running. His flashlight was beginning to die, but he didn't care. As his eyes bled from the splinters of glass and what was left of his hand dripped from the jagged nub of his wrist, all he could do was keep moving forwards. He panted and screamed and stumbled in the dark until he tripped on something he didn't notice and pitched forwards. He tumbled into the gaping maw of a nearby pipe, surrounded by unseeable, unknowable ooze, as he tumbled further down into the seemingly infinite darkness. It was too dark to see and too cramped to move anywhere but straight down. All he could do was scream and scream and scream, until his voice was hoarse and his throat bled, though nobody was there to even hear his cries. Days later, when his skin started to shred off, it was almost welcome. Dr. Gears would later receive the news of this tragically failed mission and the three operatives now declared MIA because of it. He sighed and wrote up his report on the matter, closing with the sentence, Data deemed non-vital in light of lost staff. 
SCP-015 classification level review suggested. The Foundation was in chaos. One minute, Dr. Bright was looking into some harmless products on Amazon to help the Foundation's anomalies have a nicer experience in their cells. The next, he was physically fighting for his life against the company's CEO. Of course, Dr. Bright's wacky antics have revealed the location of the SCP Foundation's most valuable containment site to Jeff Bezos and his legions of minions. Does Dr. Jack Bright have it in him to fix his mistake? Defeat the mighty Jeff Bezos and save the SCP Foundation from corporate servitude? Are the forces of the SCP Foundation equal in strength to the Amazon Horde? And how, at the 11th hour, will anomalies like SCP-096, SCP-682, SCP-173, and SCP-049 help save the day? Buckle up. The only way to find out is to keep watching. The two titans, Dr. Bright and the freakishly buff Jeff Bezos, were locked into an intense struggle. The hapless immortal tried his best to punch and kick the augmented CEO, but all it did was make Bezos laugh. Pathetic Jack! Bezos roared. Let me show you how a real man does it. With one punch, Bezos sent Dr. Bright skidding across the dirt, seeing stars. Bezos punched him so hard, Dr. Bright felt like he'd been hit by a runaway truck. Where had he even gotten all this anomalous technology? Something more was going on here. But before Dr. Bright could collect his thoughts, Bezos was already upon him. The ruthless business mogul clasped his hands together and brought them down onto the back of Jack's head in a brutal pile drive, burying his head in the dirt. The guards of Site-19 looked on in terror at the thousands of Amazon troops surrounding them, and they were betting all this on a fistfight, and what's more, it didn't even look like Dr. Bright was winning that fight, unless the good doctor used his special move. Bezos, still cackling like a Saturday morning cartoon villain, grabbed Dr. Bright by his hair and dragged him out of the dirt. He lifted the doctor, bloody and bashed with one hand. At that moment, Dr. Bright knew that he had to go with the nuclear option here. He needed to use SCP-963 to take over the body of Jeff Bezos and end this demented war. Had enough, Jack, Bezos said. Or do you want me to humiliate you even more in front of your sad little employees? Or should I say my sad little employees? <laughs> Without another word, Dr. Bright grabbed the amulet hanging around his neck and balled it into his fist. Moving as quickly as he could, he lunged at Bezos with the medallion, knowing that one touch should be enough to finish this whole thing. But then, the unexpected happened. Bezos caught Dr. Bright's hand. The flesh of the CEO's fist turned obsidian black. He gave a cruel smirk. He was still himself. Impossible. All the SCP Foundation staff in attendance were shocked and horrified, but none more than Dr. Bright himself. This was the first time that SCP-963 simply hadn't worked. I, I, I don't understand, Jack said, voice trembling as Bezos squeezed his hand with an iron grip. I should have taken you over. How is this possible? Bezos chuckled before unleashing a brutal headbutt on Dr. Bright, throwing him back through the air. Bright was lucky he managed to keep a grip on the medallion. This body hadn't worn it for 30 days. If he dropped it, it would have just been another useless necklace. Nano machines, son! Bezos barked, cracking his neck back into place. I had them designed with you in mind. Anytime and anywhere your necklace touches me, they reshuffle my genetics to turn that flesh into inanimate pseudo-metal. Do you think I'd lead an assault on the SCP Foundation without planning for every possible eventuality? I've been playing the long game. It was at this point, the Foundation guards assembled outside the building opened fire on Bezos, but it was no use. The bullets just ricocheted off of his anomalously enhanced physique. He just gave a bellowing laugh and ordered the full strength of his forces to move in. As far as he was concerned, the fight was already won. If their forces could plant the grinning Amazon flag in the heart of Site-19, the SCP Foundation would be his. It was time for the true final battle to begin. Amazon's troops loaded their weapons and charged, firing volley after volley of bullets onto the Foundation's guards entrenched in their positions. Of course, the Foundation personnel was better trained, but the Amazon army outnumbered them 10 to 1. It was only a matter of time until the barricades gave way, and the forces spilled into the containment facility. And then, they did. Inside the building, Dr. Clef was reading his new copy of Shotguns, A Comprehensive Guide, when the army breached the perimeter. 
It was at this point that he put down the book and picked up his favorite shotgun, a Remington Model 1187. Fun fact, also the preferred weapon of Anton Shigura from No Country for Old Men, and entered the fray. They'd need every SCP Foundation hand on deck to repel the incoming attack. The one thing that not even Dr. Clef predicted was for the anomalies to get involved too. You see, in ordering his troops to attack Site-19, the fleet of Amazon attack helicopters above began launching AGM-114 Hellfire missiles at the building to knock out guard towers and strategic communications arrays. This, however, had the unintended effect of causing power fluctuations within the building, and with so many of the reserve generators devoted to maintaining external security against the Amazon army, internal security failed entirely. In other words, a whole lot of cell doors were popping open. A group of Amazon foot soldiers were making their way down hallway 6C when they saw something strange on the ground. A tide of green bubbling chemicals that produced a horrific smell. Little did they know, this was powerful hydrochloric acid, but in this instance, it wasn't the acid they should be worried about. They heard a raspy voice behind them say, Disgusting. That's when they turned to see SCP-682, the giant rage-fueled immortal reptile standing right behind them. It had just finished its exotic beef jerky collection, and now it was eager for seconds. The Amazon soldiers panicked and began to open fire on the beast, but all that succeeded in doing was annoying it. SCP-682 leaped onto them and began devouring the group of hapless mercenaries alive. Elsewhere in the facility, Another group of Amazon mercenaries were chasing some defenseless SCP Foundation researchers through the secure humanoid containment wing. The researchers tried to run, but soon they were backed into a corner. The mercenaries laughed and leveled their assault rifles. This would be an easy kill. However, the second they tried to fire, they realized something extremely strange had occurred. All of their guns had turned into delightful bouquets. Standing between them and the researchers they intended to kill was SCP-343, also known to some as God. Now, now, boys, SCP-343 said with a slight smile. Can't we all just get along? Make love, not war. Frightened by the seemingly impossible act they just witnessed, the now unarmed mercenaries ran into a nearby room with a sturdy-looking door and locked themselves in. Hopefully, nobody would get them here. That thought was interrupted by a grandiose voice with an archaic French accent speaking out behind them. Why, hello there, good sirs. So kind of you to step into my practice today. They turned and saw a strange, robed man wearing a runner pigeon mask. The figure removed the mask, only to reveal what seemed like another strange beaked mask underneath. It was SCP-049, his desk covered in pleasingly polished Amazon medical tools. My, my, you gents seem a little under the weather. This is cause for concern, the plague doctor said as he began to walk towards the frightened mercenaries. The pestilence runs rife these days. Not to worry, though, I am an expert, and I've been itching to try out my lovely new tools. Horrified screaming was heard from the room shortly after, then silence. But Amazon troops kept pouring in. It was an all-out assault beyond any that Site-19 had ever experienced. Some Amazon strike teams were making their way through the break rooms, hunting for more Foundation employees to capture or execute. One of them remarked that these SCP Foundation employees must be real head cases. Why else would they keep such hideous concrete sculptures in their break room? Utterly bizarre. The second they found there was no one inside and turned to leave the room, they all lay dead on the ground with snapped necks. That would make it 17 Amazon mercenaries they'd killed today. The sculpture was having a truly wonderful time. Meanwhile, over in his office, Dr. Clef was fighting for his life. A group of junior researchers were taking refuge in there with him, and handing him shotgun shells from his many, many boxes of them when he needed to reload. Soldier after soldier was running into the room, and Clef was using his trusty Remington pump action to blow them away with incredible precision every time one of them ran in. An awestruck researcher asked, How are you this good with that thing? Clef laughed and said, Kid, I could unbutton your lab coat with it. But then tragedy struck. Dr. Clef ran out of shells. He sighed and told the assembled researchers to run out of the back exit and save themselves. He'd hold back the tide of Amazon mercenaries alone. He kissed his shotgun and said, Forgive me for this, Remy. Then grabbed it by the barrel. If he couldn't shoot with it, he'd at least use it as a club. 
He ran out into the fray, bashing down mercenaries left and right with his shotgun club until he was finally outnumbered. A group of heavily armed soldiers surrounded him, holding him at gunpoint. One of them gave the order to fire. Wait, Dr. Clef said. I can be valuable to you. You don't know who I am, do you? Give me a second, let me show you my ID. Dr. Clef pulled an ID wallet from his lab coat and then showed it to the soldiers. They looked at it, confused and a little disturbed. The leader of the group said, That's not an ID card, you schmuck. What the hell is that ugly thing, anyway? By this point, Dr. Clef had already closed his eyes. A distant screaming got closer and closer until the wall of his office exploded. SCP-096 entered the room, shrieking with rage and began tearing the hapless soldiers to shreds. Clef rolled away, keeping his eyes closed and waiting for the carnage to be over. But in a grander sense, the carnage had only just begun. Oh, and for those who were curious, yes, SCP-811 did get her blobfish plushie. She loved it. Outside the facility, Jeff Bezos looked upon the destruction he wrought and laughed. It was just as wonderful as he'd imagined it in all his years of intense planning for this very moment. It all unfolded exactly to his design. The SCP Foundation would fall, and his master plan would finally be complete. Dr. Jack Bright, demoralized but not defeated, rose shakily to his feet. This whole disaster had been his fault. He had to redeem this. He had to defeat Jeff Bezos, or the Foundation would fall into his iron clutches. Even if it finally, truly killed him, Dr. Bright would not give up. Impressive tech, Dr. Bright said, cracking his knuckles and getting Jeff's attention again. Which sweatshop built it for you? Jeff just laughed and turned to Bright again, more than ready for round two. A little place called Prometheus Labs, Jack, Jeff said. Remember them? I was on the board of directors before the incident. Just like you and your foundation dogs, they left behind plenty of goodies for me. Dr. Bright charged at Bezos, screaming in animal fury. He punched the smug, anomalous businessman square in the jaw. Bezos barely even flinched. He gave Jack an utterly brutal, open-handed slap, knocking him towards the entrance to Site-19, where more Amazon soldiers were still pouring in. Still, Jack began to stand again. What? <sighs> what the hell does a corporate stiff like you want with the SCP Foundation? He said. We want to help the world, not rule it. Bezos sneered and began stomping towards the immortal doctor. I don't just want to rule the world, Jack. I want to hold it in my hand like an apple and take a big juicy bite. All that exists will belong to me, he said, throwing a punch that Dr. Bright was thankfully able to dodge. That's always been the plan, and the SCP Foundation is the final piece I need. Dr. Bright, summoning all the adrenaline in his body, unleashed a flurry of sharp punches to Jeff's abdomen. He simply tanked every strike and laughed. I've been funding the Chaos Insurgency for years, Jack. I'm one of Marshall Carter and Dark's largest shareholders. Amazon is Dr. Wondertainment's primary global distributor. The Sarkists, the Fifthists, the Mechanites, those pretentious art snobs, are we cool yet? They're all in my deep pockets. Jeff roared. He wrapped one of his massive hands around Dr. Bright's throat and lifted him clear off the ground. Jack struggled against his grip. You've spent decades worrying about all the wrong things, Jack, Jeff said slowly, tightening his grip around Dr. Bright's throat. The Devourer of Worlds, the Black Moon, the Scarlet King, my new world won't have a king. It'll have a CEO. And with the power within these walls, I'll be the chairman of the Cosmic Board! And it all starts with me killing you and turning your silly little necklace into a paperweight. But Jack had an ace up his sleeve, something he had the good sense to pocket before facing Bezos on the battlefield. He reached into his lab coat and pulled out SCP-662, the butler's handbell. One little ring and Mr. Deeds suddenly appeared right next to them. Jack barely managed to wheeze out, Deeds, kick Jeff in the groin. Of course, sir. Uh, Mr. Deed said before doing exactly that. Jeff winced in pain and loosened his grip on Dr. Bright's neck. The plucky immortal took his chance to wriggle free from Jeff's grip and run into the facility yelling back, Deed, stall him! But before Deeds could execute this order, Jeff Bezos fractured the anomalous butler's skull with a single punch and chased Dr. Bright into the facility. He would have his revenge. As Dr. Bright fled, he grabbed his foundation walkie-talkie and frantically spoke into it. Clef, I'm in big trouble. I think I have a way to stop this, but there's just something you need to do for me first. Battles were raging throughout the site. Some Amazon soldiers had unloaded their rifles into Kane, only to find themselves on the floor dying of massive blood loss. 
Other squadrons of mercenaries were being tortured by the nightmarish SCP-106 in his terrifying pocket dimension. He was having a wonderful time. SCP-999 was even tickling a gaggle of Amazon's hired veteran war criminals into absolute submission. Much to Jeff's rage and horror, it looked like with the help of the anomalies, the Foundation might actually be able to turn the tide. This would not do. He'd destroy Bright and take care of the rest personally. It has to be this way, Jack! Bezos yelled after the fleeing doctor. I'm making the mother of all corporate omelets here, can't fret over a few ransacked containment sites. Bezos' self-aggrandizing rants were interrupted by SCP-682 leaping onto him out of an adjoining hallway, giving Dr. Bright even more time to create distance between them. 682 fought valiantly and viciously, but Jeff's Prometheus Labs nanomachine augmentations gave him the edge. He was able to get SCP-682 into a headlock, Steve Irwin style, then punch it in the head until it was knocked out. Jeff sighed, relieved, and continued to chase after Jack. As Jeff turned a corner to chase Dr. Bright, he ran right into one of Jack's traps. There was Dr. Bright standing about 15 feet away from him, holding his favorite item that he normally wasn't allowed to use, the chainsaw cannon. Jack smirked and said, Smile, you son of a- Boom! A chainsaw projectile blasted towards Jeff at incredible speeds. It was through pure luck and superhuman reflexes that Jeff was able to catch it between his palms by the blade and hold it in place, even as it cut into his nanite-hardened skin. With a grunt of rage, he threw the saw into the ground. Is that all you got, Jack? He growled. Not quite, Dr. Bright replied. I've got a few friends who owe me some favors. Suddenly, Bezos heard footsteps behind him. He turned to see three figures standing there, primed and ready for battle. SCP-4494, The Spectre, SCP-5151, The Black Knight, and SCP-2800, Cactus Man. You fight without honor, Sir Jeffrey, the Black Knight proclaimed as he drew his longsword. Aye, and I can't stand bullies said Cactus Man as his spikes began to grow. Wage theft and tax evasion is a crime, evildoer, the Spectre added. Well then, Jeff said, I suppose I'll just have to kill you all. The fight began. Our group of four heroes held their own impressively to begin with. They consistently helped each other block or avoid the deadly strikes that Bezos was unleashing and returning their own. Four anomalies against one. The Black Knight even gave Dr. Bright one of his spare swords to give him a better chance of landing a meaningful blow against Bezos. But in the end, it was all for nothing. Bezos powered up his nanomachines, drawing energy from the building around him until he was even larger and stronger. In his state, he easily beat down his four attackers, incapacitating them and standing over Bright. It's useless, Jack, he said with another evil laugh. You can't beat me. I know, Jack groaned in pain, but I did a pretty good job of stalling you. At that moment, Clef came running down the hall wielding another firearm, but it wasn't a shotgun this time. In fact, it didn't even look like a real gun. It looked like a spray-painted Nerf gun. That got another laugh out of Jeff. What an utterly feeble attempt. That's when Dr. Clef leveled the Nerf gun and fired one of its darts against Jeff's chest, where it seemed to bounce off uselessly. Really? He asked, incredulous. Come on, this is just getting... His words were cut off by an uppercut from Dr. Bright. Inexplicably, he actually felt that one. Jeff staggered back, rubbing his jaw as Bright rose to his feet. How the hell did you hurt me? Jeff muttered, genuinely shocked. Dr. Bright smirked. That was the nerfing gun, Chrome Dome. We just made your precious nanomachines useless. With another incredibly well-earned punch in the face from Dr. Bright, Jeff was down on the ground with a bleeding nose. Elsewhere in the facility, the researchers, guards, and anomalies working together had defeated the dark forces of Amazon. Outside, Hammerdown, the largest and most militarily powerful mobile task force, had arrived and wiped out what remained of Jeff's invasion force outside. It wasn't easy, but the SCP Foundation had won. As Jeff lay on the ground holding his broken nose, Dr. Bright held him at sword point. Wait, w wait, Jeff said. That's not let hard feelings linger. We're both adults, right? And I'm a businessman. I make deals, compromises. I can give you anything from the Amazon stock, free of charge, as long as we agree that I can go and we forget all about this. Dr. Bright smiled and thought it over. Well, he said, there are few things I'd like for myself, and there are still plenty more anomalies that need enriching. Victory secured. 
Want another video about the deranged things Dr. Bright bought for even more anomalies and Foundation staff? Let us know down in the comments, and we'll continue the strangest story that the SCP Foundation's most eccentric researcher ever told. 2 a.m., a few miles outside the city. The car tore down the asphalt at 60 miles an hour. We kept the beams low, the dark road around us only illuminated by the occasional street lamp overhead. Things moved unseen in the trees. An old song rattled off the radio. The connection was patchy, so it was interrupted by intermittent spikes of static. It was the kind of night when you knew, deep down, that anything could happen. You just hoped that anything would be in your favor. I rolled the window down a few minutes ago, breathing in all that cold, fresh air to stave off the looming specter of sleep. Thank God I wasn't the one driving, or things would have gotten deadly way sooner. Cops would have found us with our bumper wrapped around a tree, our heads one with the steering wheel or the windshield dead on impact or from the unforgiving cold overnight. They might have even felt sorry for us until they found the case. Perhaps it would have been better that way. At least it would have been quick. A lot of bad things can happen on lonely state highways in the dead of night, and we were about to find out that just crashing your car was one of the more mild ones. Scott was driving. He was also the one who brokered this whole deal. I was just coming along to provide backup. There was a fully loaded Saturday night special sitting in my inner coat pocket hoping that it wouldn't see any action tonight, and a pump-action shotgun sitting in the back in case things got really hairy. Deals like this, you either come well prepared, or reckon with a heavy chance you sure as hell won't be leaving. I never asked Scott how he came into the goods currently sitting in the briefcase, and he never offered an explanation either. He only told me that he'd already secured a very interested potential buyer from a syndicate out of town. Serious people. Dangerous people. They'd pay top dollar, or leave us tied up in trash bags in a ditch off the side of the highway. But we both needed money, and we were willing to take that risk if it meant we could return from this deal as a pair of rich men. The terms of the deal were simple. We drive out onto a certain state highway at a little after 2 a.m. with the goods, meet the buyers at a certain rest stop along the way, and make the exchange. We'd then all go our separate ways, and if we were lucky, none of us would ever see each other ever again. Seemed simple enough, sure. Scott seemed downright chipper about the whole thing. And for a little while, I was excited too, until he told me about the road that the buyers wanted to meet us on. We'd all heard legends about the place. Superstitions, really. People think criminals are scary, but believe me, we're a surprisingly superstitious bunch. Our profession is one largely based on luck. Being in the right place at the right time, and being lucky enough to avoid the cops along the way. But something you need to know, whether you're a criminal or arrow straight, is that some places are always going to be the wrong place. I'm not gonna tell you which road it is. I know what you knuckleheads are like. You're curious. You're thrill seekers. Hey, we were all young once, but if I tell you what this road is, I know you're gonna try to find it. Maybe you'll even decide it's worth the trip down for a pleasant Sunday drive. <laughs> After what I went through on that road, I wouldn't wish a trip down it on my worst enemy. There's no other word for what we encountered there other than evil. When we were kids, we used to call it the Devil's Passage. Every spooky rumor and scary story in the book circulated about that place. Let me see what I can remember. Well, there was the Watcher in the Woods. People used to say that there was a long, tall figure with the biggest eyes you had ever seen. Eyes like headlights, standing amongst the trees. If the moonlight shone in the right angle as you were driving past, you'd see it standing there, just staring at you, thinking about doing who knows what. Then there was Old Beth, the ghostly hitchhiker. People used to say they saw a strange old woman hobbling down the side of the road in the middle of the night. Sometimes people said that they could hear her crying, even if they were far enough away to make such a thing seem impossible. If you took pity on her and pulled over, asking her if she needed a ride, she'd tell you that you were a very kind person, but that she was fine and dandy walking along by herself. But if you didn't stop and offer her a lift, if you just drove away, well, local legend had it that the next time you'd see her face would be in your rearview mirror as she sat in your back seat, reaching for you with her ancient bony claws. It'd make you think twice about leaving an old woman to walk home alone in the dark. And, of course, there was the lone jogger. The stories my dad told me about him always used to scare the hell out of me. He was a pale man, dressed unnaturally light for the cold winter months, jogging along the side of the road. If you looked at him, he'd look back. If your eyes ever met, the stories went that he'd start running after you. It wouldn't matter how fast you drove, he'd somehow always catch up and stare at you through the glass of your car's windows. 
He never hurt anyone directly, but I imagine he probably caused a heart attack or two in his time, if he ever really existed. But all of these things were nothing, I repeat, nothing compared to the Phantom Cruiser. You have to drive cautiously at night, because if you didn't, you might find a ghostly 1970s police cruiser tailgating you, and that'd be the worst thing you ever saw. There were fewer stories about this one than all the others, because if you ever ran afoul of the Phantom Cruiser, chances are that you wouldn't survive to tell people about what happened to you, though people could still make an educated guess about what happened to you based on whatever was left behind. Here's a not-so-fun fact. The Devil's Passage is technically qualified for one of the most dangerous highways in the country, from crashes to hitchhiker murders to unexplained deaths on the side of the road. Since 1974, this road has been an incredibly unpleasant place to drive. Every time I saw another horror story about a strange death on the road, I'd think of the Phantom Cruiser, and it was those same thoughts polluting my brain that night as Scott drove the two of us to the rest stop halfway down the Devil's Passage. I only realized I'd dozed off when he nudged me awake, and the blurry lights of distant street lamps flashed into my field of vision. Look alive, he said. We're here. The rest stop wasn't much to look at. All that there was was an abandoned gas station, really the perfect place for this kind of illicit deal. My hand moved instinctively to the special in my coat and clicked back the hammer. Something about this whole setup wasn't right. Sting operation? Police ambush? This whole thing reeked of a deal too good to be true. My instincts turned out to be right, in a sense, just not the way I was expecting. As we turned into the rest stop, Scott turned up his beams. All we saw was carnage waiting for us. A car, presumably one that once belonged to our prospective buyers, in a state of horrific disarray. It looked as though a train had impacted the side of the vehicle, completely caving it in. The metal was covered in deep scratches and ruts that almost looked like claw marks. It had been eviscerated. Scott broke, hard, and we both got out of the car. I drew the special out of my jacket, and he grabbed the shotgun out of the back seat. We approached with caution, worrying this might just be another part of the setup, until we saw the thick puddle of blood congealing under the driver's side door. We drew closer, propelled by morbid curiosity. Was it a hit from a rival gang looking to intercept the deal? It seemed logical, but there were no bullet holes in the car, just ripping, tearing, and massive impact damage. Scott shined the light of his phone into the destroyed car, and I vomited when I saw what was inside. The buyers looked less like people, and more like two sacks of pulled pork in tattered clothes. If I hadn't seen them inside the car, I wouldn't have even guessed they were human, and the damage wasn't just to them. The upholstery was torn up and burned, with violent symbols carved into the walls and scrawled onto the cracked windows in blood. When I turned to Scott, he was ghost white, clutching his phone and shotgun with trembling hands. We didn't exchange a word, but we both knew it was time to leave. We could find another buyer, there'd be other opportunities, other deals, but lives? You only get one, and we both silently acknowledged that if we stuck around here much longer, we wouldn't even have that. We sped back into the car and locked the doors behind us, for whatever good that would do, considering the damage that had been done to the buyers and their car. Perhaps we just needed the illusion of security to get us the hell out of there. The car pulled out of the rest stop at breakneck speed. Scott floored it, trying to put some good distance between us and the horror at that rest stop. Whatever had happened to the buyers, we didn't fancy sharing that same awful fate. My heart dropped down to my guts when I heard the sirens and flashing lights behind us. After all this, we'd been busted for speeding. They'd pull us over and find the guns and the briefcase in the car, and they'd have a lot of questions that neither of us would have good answers to. We didn't know whether to slow down and hope for the best, or speed up and take this boy in blue on a genuine car chase. This whole thing couldn't have gone more wrong. But my thoughts soon drifted from getting used to the taste of prison food to something altogether more sinister. When I saw the car getting closer in the rearview mirror, I realized that this wasn't a modern cop car tailing us. It was a beat-up old 70s cruiser, traveling at insane speeds, gaining on us. The high beams cut through me like razor blades. I heard the radio crackle into life, even though neither I nor Scott touched it. It wasn't music, just a hoarse, scratchy voice repeating the word, RUN, again and again. And seeing as whatever was behind us clearly wasn't a real cop, we were more than happy to oblige that request. Scott hit the gas like our lives depended on it, which, to be fair, they did. But no matter how fast we sped up, the cruiser kept getting closer, like a demon on our tail. I screamed at Scott to go faster, but we were going as fast as we could. 
Next thing I knew, the Phantom Cruiser collided with the backside of our car and sent us into a spin, showering the two of us with broken glass crystals as the tires screeched across the asphalt. It felt like an eternity before the car came to a rest, and at that moment, the Phantom Cruiser stopped too. Someone got out. He was dressed like a cop, he even looked like a cop. A dude in his 40s, balding, overweight, with a handlebar mustache. But something was wrong about him. He didn't say a word as he approached the car, and he didn't seem to register me sliding the special out of my jacket either. He was inches away from Scott's window when I panicked and opened fire, sending a hail of small caliber rounds into his gut. He stumbled back slightly, as though shocked, and then everything got a whole lot worse. The cop let out the most awful bellow, not of pain, but of pure rage. Something happened to his face. His eyes started to glow a bright, hellish red, and his jaw began to extend until he looked like a munch painting. There were no teeth in there, just an infinite black void. He grabbed a dazed Scott through the window, pulling him into a brutal headlock and dragging him out of the car, releasing those deranged bellows the entire time. Scott screamed and pleaded for help. I grabbed his body and tried to pull him back, but the cop was inhumanly strong. He just kept pulling, until he was all the way out, thrashing on the asphalt. I, I, I don't want to tell you what he did next. Wouldn't be right. But suffice to say, I couldn't save Scott. And I definitely didn't want it happening to me. While he was working on Scott, I scrambled into the driver's seat and floored it, hoping that Scott would at least buy me some time. I was weeping in terror as I drove away into the dark, leaving my friend to a horrible fate with the driver of the Phantom Cruiser. So you can only imagine how I felt when a few minutes later, I heard the sirens again and saw the bright lights getting closer behind me. Run, run, run. The year was 1991. It was a quiet night in Lethargy Valley, Arizona, the quietest town in all of Maricopa County. Seriously, despite the hardcore Arizona dry heat, this is one of the most idyllic little towns you could imagine. Everyone who lived there knew each other by name and regularly invited their neighbors to wholesome neighborhood cookouts. The town's historic main street had an old-fashioned ice cream parlor, a knitting supply store, and even a Build-A-Bear workshop. And, of course, a few local car dealerships and auto body shops. Lethargy Valley really is just the sweetest, calmest place you could possibly imagine. And tonight, my friends, it's going to rock. While the citizens of Lethargy Valley went about their evening duties, something hardcore was heading their way. Rumbling across the scorching Arizona deserts, burning fuel and belching smog. The hottest hot rods this side of the sun. Wheels so fly they're ready to take off, with riders so badass their own reflections are scared of them. That's right. These are the high-octane, full-throttle adventures of the exploding zombie gearheads, and they're about to give this sleepy Arizona town a four loco enema. The sun was setting on Lethargy Valley when the lights of distant fire cut through the night. Citizens and shopkeepers enjoying an evening summer breeze halted in town as the redness in the east got closer and brighter. They could feel the rumble of torqued-up subwoofers rattling the ground. The roar of the engines felt more fitting on 747s than road-legal cars. And when the distance was close enough that they could taste the vapors of burning gasoline in the air, they could finally hear the laughter, too. Meet SCP-3885-01, also known as the Exploding Zombie Gearheads, probably the most metal of all anomalies on the SCP Foundation catalog. But let's talk about them before these gas-chugging dust devils were just another number in the man's filing cabinet. Cause these bad boys don't care about filing, they only care about defiling. They rolled into Lethargy Valley like a pack of easy-riding coyotes on gearhead steroids. Their skin is green from rot, and covered in cuts, lesions, and gnarly burn scars. Some have their heads completely cracked open, exposing what little brains they have underneath. Others have fully opened rib cages and disemboweled bellies, but they don't care. These ain't your grandpa's zombies. Forget the walking dead. These dudes are the riding dead. Romero meets Ratfink after ten lines of Colombian Bam Bam and a gallon of monster energy drink decked out in a patchwork of motorhead-style leather and stolen clothes. And you best believe these fun dead freakazoids are here to party hardy. 
Polly Poundtown rounded the corner of Main Street first on his ride, the Murderlizer. In past life, it had been a coffin, but now with the aid of two monster truck wheels on the back and a pair of circular saw blades on the front, it was a vehicle ready to tear up the streets. Literally. Polly drove down the road at a breakneck pace, leaving a trail of sparks and black smog behind him. He was screaming something about being king of the world when the vehicle exploded underneath him. The force of the boom flung Polly down the length of the street. He hit the window of a local barbershop and shattered through like a fleshy missile. For a moment, he lay on the tiles, a leather pincushion of broken glass and wooden shrapnel from the recently detonated Myrtleizer. But at no moment in this whole insane ordeal did Polly stop laughing. He got up, noticed his neck was twisted backward at an odd angle. We told you it was a breakneck pace. But Polly just grabbed that sucker and crunched it back into place. It'd take a little more than a totaled spine to stop Polly Poundtown. After all, the night's fun was only just starting. More tricked out zombie roadsters were pouring into the town from every angle. Hopped up on a combination of tequila, lighter fluid, and some stuff we can't even mention if we want to keep monetization on this video. Steely Dan was roaring into the Build-A-Bear workshop on a modified toilet with all crushing caterpillar tracks. Once he'd busted through the facade, he dismounted his porcelain throne and began incinerating walls of teddy bears with a custom flamethrower, powered by a tube going into his stomach cavity. Once he was done burning 90% of the bears in the store, he used the remaining unsullied parts to make a grungy-looking bear in his own likeness. He strapped it to the front of his terrifying mobile toilet and then burnt that too, just for the fun of it. Bearback Boris was making a beeline for the ice cream parlor, riding what would look like a bowl to the untrained eye. It was actually a taxidermied bowl, gutted and fitted with a nightmarish configuration of motorcycle parts that would function better together as a method of execution than a workable vehicle. But that's just how the exploding zombie gearheads like it. Boris pulled the handbrake, which was made out of some old bones he dug up once, and ground the bowl cycle to a screeching halt in front of the parlor. He climbed off and kicked in the door, before running in to cause some chaos. Boris, the animal that he was, grabbed handfuls of gelato and shoved them into his mouth, before turning and spitting them at the wall. He pulled out a bottle of 90% vodka and took a long swig, before taking a court summons out of his jacket and shoving it into the bottle. He lit the top of the litigious fuse with his lighter, which was shaped like a knife, and made a Molotov cocktail. Moments later, the whole store was in flames. Boris stepped out of the burning ice cream parlor, on fire but utterly unfazed. He pulled out no less than four cigars and lit them on his own burning skin, before smoking each one in a single pull. If his lungs didn't already look like blackened lumps of decaying coal, they would have been screaming at him. But right now, the only person screaming was Gene Simmons of the band Kiss, as some of Boris's fellow riders rampaged through the streets past him, unholy blaring from their radios at ear-exploding volumes. The exploding zombie gearheads didn't throw out-of-town ragers like this often, but when they did, they always tried to make it one for the history books. And before you start worrying about the safety of the citizens of Lethargy Valley, Arizona, you should know that the zombie gearheads never hurt anybody. Well, never hurt anybody on purpose, that is. If a piece of stray shrapnel from an exploding Camaro reshaped with scrap metal to look like a giant fist spraying fire from its knuckles happens to take out somebody's eye, well, that can't really be seen as anybody's fault, can it? Especially when you don't have eyes anymore. The closest thing to the brains of this operation, which for these guys really isn't saying much, was a free-thinking, free-spirited, free-liquored individual known as Joey... <clears throat> nuts. The whole gang had probably about 40 brain cells between them, but at least five of those cells belonged to Joey. While many of his rotting buddies were goofing off and causing mayhem across town, Joey was already acting on the real reason everybody was here, getting new parts for their sick-as-all-hell car mods. Sure, as mechanics, they couldn't produce actually workable vehicles worth a damn, but at the end of the day, isn't a vehicle looking awesome much more important than boring old functionality? If you think otherwise, you're probably just a square. But we digress. Back to Joey... <clears throat> nuts. Joey and a crew of his boys, including Dirty Mike, Scuzzy Steve, and generally unclean Gary, rolled up to one of the local auto body shops and bashed the door down with their vehicle. 
which, by the way, was a modified SUV modified with bulldozer parts and a makeshift cannon. It was a powerful, if structurally unsound, motorized siege weapon. Joey and the boys jumped off the vehicle and stormed into the building, wielding pipe wrenches with nails and fishing hooks welded onto them. A confused mechanic was quaking in his boots as the gaggle of zombie gearheads approached him. Joey stood at the front, swinging his pipe wrench around with menacing randomness. He was chewing 12 toothpicks, making him look extra tough. The mechanic, with a quiet trembling voice, told Joey and the boys that they needed to leave. They weren't supposed to be back here. They needed to leave and come back during opening hours. It was the most polite telling off he could possibly muster. The exploding zombie gearheads just laughed. Once they were done cackling, Joey lifted up his pipe wrench and pointed it at the terrified mechanic's face. Joey cleared his tobacco and gasoline burn throat and said, Listen, you stupid grease monkey, I'm only gonna say this once, so open your ear holes real wide and listen up, okay? You're gonna pack up your crap and leave, so me and my boys can loot this place to our heart's content and beef up our sick ass rides. And if you don't leave, <laughs> you're gonna be holding this here pipe wrench for me in your prison pocket. You get me? The mechanic definitely got him. He didn't waste a moment in hightailing it out of the store while Joey and the boys pulled a classic smash and grab on his wares. They stole everything from whole cars to wrenches and lug nuts. Across town, the exploding zombie gearheads were doing the exact same thing stealing or stripping every vehicle in sight and cannibalizing the parts for their own righteous whips. Town by town, vehicle by vehicle, explosion by explosion, they'd one day figure this whole mechanic deal out. With the night's revelry finally concluded, it was time to return home and get to work on the next set of rides. This legion of awesome, unkillable morons piled back into their stylish death traps and rode off into the misty dawn leaving hundreds of thousands of dollars in property damage behind them, but not a single death. As hyper-destructive anomalies go, they're honestly pretty benevolent, or at least too self-centered to be truly malevolent. They tore up the desert on their way back to the real SCP-3885, Vulture Gulch, the home of the exploding zombie gearheads. It's a desert shantytown that's officially been abandoned since July 9, 1973 due to high volumes of dangerous radion gas being emitted from the uranium deposits in a nearby mine. But these intense joyriding mutants hardly mind a little bit of radiation in their sweet pad. Be it ever so radioactive, there's no place like home, right? Some of the vehicles even exploded on the way back to the place, but the boys didn't mind. The flaming explosion survivors just crawled out of the fire and hopped onto the rides of their closest buddies. All in all, everyone in attendance had a damn good time that night. They'd spend the rest of the early morning setting rocks on fire for fun and chewing on ignited fireworks. That's the kind of brain trust we're dealing with here. When the Foundation eventually contained them in Vulture Gulch, the gearheads didn't even put up a fuss, as long as the Foundation kept supplying them with three decommissioned vehicles every month. It's a pretty sweet deal. A crazed car lover's paradise, where as long as you keep it within the walls, anything goes, baby. But there is one strange little detail, a question that remains unanswered. Drones sent in by the Foundation to spy on the residents of Vulture Gulch have picked up one strange recurring theme in their chatter, mentions of an individual known only as The Boss paying them a visit. And we can only assume they don't mean Bruce Springsteen, the only clues we have are that the gearheads believe this boss created them and put them here on this earth to be totally rad. The other clue is a seemingly pervasive belief that, someday soon, the boss will return. Who do you think the boss of the exploding zombie gearheads truly is? Let us know down in the comments. Man, it's even better on the 15th read. Oh, hello, I didn't see you there, dear viewers of SCP Explained. I'm on break between supervising SCP-682 termination attempts and inspecting the mops we use on SCP-173's leavings, so I decided to do what all the cool people are doing in their spare time right now. Rereading Chainsaw Man, the hit manga by Japanese author and artist Tatsuki Fujimoto. For the uninitiated, it's the story of Denji, a poor young man from Japan who makes his living hunting devils, dangerous creatures that are embodiments of mankind's greatest fears. But when that living leads to him dying at the hands of a gang of zombie Yakuza, believe me, it makes sense in context, 
he bonds with the legendary Chainsaw Devil and is reborn as Chainsaw Man, an unconventional superhero who chainsaws first and asks questions later. Naturally, I was eager to see how one of our own bloodthirsty killers would fare against Denji's Chainsaws of Fury, so I selected the most violent, battle-hardened, and carnage-hungry anomaly out there, SCP-076-2, the immortal warrior known as Abel. The two of them have a surprising amount of things in common. Both are effectively immortal and can revive after sustaining massive physical injuries. Both absolutely love to fight with their array of deadly weapons and anomalous strength. Both have been part of experimental operations groups, with Denji being a member of Japan's Public Safety Devil Hunters Division 4, and Abel being an ex-member of the SCP Foundation's disastrous Pandora's Box Mobile Task Force, most of which he later massacred out of boredom. You can probably see why these two really did feel like the perfect matchup. So after forcing the trusty Anomatron 6000 to read every currently available volume of Chainsaw Man, and compute years of Abel's gruesome battle data, I've set up the perfect simulation for your viewing pleasure. And hey, fellow fans of the manga, isn't it horrifying that even we beat MAPPA to the punch of animating this thing? <laughs> ah, god that joke will age poorly if that anime comes out before this. Anyway, let's crank this machine into action and let her rip. Japan, 1997. Everything is roasting in the July heat. Men in Black. Harrison Ford's Air Force One and Airbud are hitting theaters for the first time. Everything is right with the world. That's why over in the headquarters of the Public Safety Devil Hunting Department, Denji, our chainsaw-loving hero, is being praised by his kind boss and mentor figure, Makima, a lovable, supportive woman who will never do anything wrong. She even loves dogs. How could a person who loves dogs ever be evil? That very morning, Denji and his Chainsaw Man form managed to defeat the accidentally making a mistake on your tax forms and now you're going to prison devil, who had been terrorizing downtown Tokyo. It was a challenging battle, but in the end, he'd managed to turn the tables and defeat the creature by setting it on fire. Needless to say, Makima was extremely pleased with Denji's work here, but now she had considerably more graver news to impart. She'd gotten word from an envoy of another organization that hunts down dangerous and anomalous creatures, the SCP Foundation, that an extremely lethal entity had breached their containment and was now somewhere in Japan. The entity in question was not a devil, and thereby would be working on a different rule set. Makima opened a file faxed to her by the Foundation. Yes, remember, this is set in 1997 and gave Denji the crucial lowdown. Several hours ago, the entity known as Abel had resurrected from his huge black sarcophagus in the underwater chamber of the classified facility Containment Area 25B. After waking up, Abel had slaughtered his way through the entire base, killing every SCP Foundation operative in his path and then swimming out into the Pacific Ocean. Sometime after that, he infiltrated a Japanese cargo ship and murdered all the workers on board before steering the ship back towards the land of the rising sun, where he hoped to claim even more victims. Makima told Denji that it would fall to him and his associates to stop this Abel, with a little help from the SCP Foundation's intelligence. But be warned, Abel is an incredible combatant with extreme physical strength and durability, as well as surprising tactical intelligence. It wouldn't be an easy fight, but Makima promised that if Denji won, she'd hug him and go to a nearby karaoke bar with him. Denji replied, Consider him dead already, Miss Makima. Meanwhile, Abel was walking through the slums of Tokyo, marveling at the neon signs for bars and clubs. His journey to Japan hadn't been an accident. Abel had been to Japan once before, in the year 1605. He'd faced the legendary Japanese philosopher and swordsman Miyato Musashi, considered by many to be one of the greatest warriors in human history. Abel had dueled Musashi, who famously wielded two katanas at once, in the hills of the Harima province where, after a tense battle, Musashi cut him down. Abel would not resurrect again during Musashi's lifetime, but the battle gave him a deep and abiding respect for the legendary warrior. Abel knew that if the opportunity ever rose again, he would return to Japan in hopes of experiencing such a brilliant battle yet again. But the industrial and technological boom had changed so much, 
It was no longer the quiet and pastoral Japan he'd experienced, but a booming epicenter of trade and commerce. He found it all strange and perplexing. Suddenly, he found himself surrounded by a group of Japanese street thugs, many of them wielding switchblades. They laughed at his strange outfit, which to them looked like an old, worn bedsheet. One of the smarter members of the group had already decided to go home when the others made up their mind to mug Abel. The warrior's extensive tattoos made him look like a Middle Eastern Yakuza Don. The rest, however, were happy to take their chances with him. Empty your pockets if that goofy toga even has pockets, the leader said, holding up his switchblade. Unless you want to get cut. Abel just smirked and drew a pair of long, obsidian daggers. In the following moment, the alley was filled with screams, then was silent yet again. Abel walked on, breathing a sigh of disappointment at how incredibly mediocre this first fight had been, his blades dripping with fresh blood. Musashi is rolling in his grave, Abel thought to himself. Meanwhile, across town, Denji and the rest of Division 4 were mobilizing. It was him, the serious sword-wielding Aki, and the adorable, pathologically lying, blood-fiend, Power. They'd been told over the phone by a man named Dr. Bright that Abel would be relatively easy to track down. He's not known for his subtlety. All you need to do is follow the trail of carnage he causes wherever he goes. From the way he talks about him, it seems almost as though Dr. Bright bears a personal grudge against Abel. How strange. Power didn't seem intimidated. She proudly proclaimed, I don't think this battle will be difficult at all. In fact, I've faced this Abel before and defeated him handily. Aki sighed and asked, when did this happen? Last Tuesday, of course, she replied. Power had only heard about Abel this morning, but Denji and Aki had learned better than to dispute her at this point. Suddenly, a large television screen that had been previously relaying an ad for a cutting-edge stereo system cut to an emergency news report. There had been a horrific incident in downtown Tokyo, where a bar had been attacked and most of its patrons murdered by a deranged, tattooed man carrying a pair of huge swords. Aki immediately recognized this place. The bar was Yakuza-owned. If this Abel was on the hunt for worthy opponents, it makes all the sense in the world that Japan's iconic crime syndicates would be his first target. Denji, Aki, and Power knew exactly where they needed to go. Over at the bar, Abel was having a whale of a time. Innocent patrons were running and screaming, while the Yakuza engaged in an all-out war with a terrifying, inhuman warrior. Several of them had already been cut down. Two Yakuza soldiers behind the bar were reloading illegal Uzis and preparing to return fire. Both were sweating, terrified by the sudden, random attack. When they'd shot him before, he'd managed to dodge most of the bullets and expertly block the rest with his swords. Who the hell had sent this monster? Was he with the Triads? The Russian mob? Or some devil summoned by the Japanese government to crack down on them? Whatever the case, he seemed almost impossible to kill. The two men stood back up and opened fire. Abel held his two swords and spun like a propeller, blocking all the bullets almost effortlessly. He then produced another dagger, seemingly from thin air, and threw it directly into the heart of one of the two remaining Yakuza behind the bar. He dropped to the ground dead instantly, leaving only his friend alive in a bar full of corpses. That's when Abel noticed a decorative katana behind the bar. He smiled and ordered the surviving Yakuza soldier to pick up the sword and give him a real fight. The hapless mobster realized in that moment that this guy was truly crazy, whoever he was. But what choice did he have now? With terror in his heart, the last surviving Yakuza grabbed the katana and unsheathed it. Good, Abel said, his voice deep and menacing. Now, come fight me. Let's see if you last a few seconds longer than your worthless friends, shall we? He did not. The second the Yakuza ran towards Abel and the ancient swordsman swiped at him with one of his blades, cutting through the katana and the opponent holding it. A puny gangster never stood a chance against a deadly immortal warrior, and Abel was furious. The last time he was here, he faced a truly expert killer who even managed to end Abel's life in a single combat. And now he was slaying insects in a karaoke bar. Pathetic. Suddenly, his ears pricked up. He turned to see a red axe flying at his head at incredible speeds. With his superhuman reflexes, he managed to dodge just in time, but the axe still cleaved off a chunk of his hair as it passed. 
Abel could see the one who threw it standing at the entrance to the bar. It was the blood fiend, Power, who'd made the axe out of her own blood. Standing next to her were Denji and Aki, Denji wielding an axe and Aki stoically observing. Damn, Miss Makima promised we'd do karaoke at this bar if I beat you, Denji said. You're going down for this. Abel smiled and pulled out another pair of blades. Finally, he roared. Warriors who fight the old-fashioned way. I feared the years had stolen you all from me. Power stepped forward, producing another blood axe from nowhere. She yelled, Tremble in fear, Abel. Tis I, your arch nemesis, the mighty power! Abel had literally never seen her before in his thousands of years of life, but he appreciated that these warriors were at least able to match his level of drama. As far as he was concerned, the fight was on. But even Abel didn't know the level of fighting he was getting in for here. As he charged forward, the trio split, immediately surrounding him. Good tactics, Abel thought to himself. Already, this was promising. Aki, who had remained quiet up to this point, attacked first. He drew a Titano knife from his suit jacket and slashed at Abel with impressive speed. But unlike three of the other combatants in this situation, Aki was only human which gave him a serious disadvantage. Abel decided it would be best to put him out of commission first. With a quick and brutal kick to the chest, Aki was thrown against the wall with the majority of his ribs broken. Revved up by his own bloodlust, Abel turned to Denji in power and grinned like a maniac. This was already the most fun he'd had in a long time. Who are these people? Doesn't matter, he thought. They'll be dead soon anyway. While Abel was still locked in thought, Power pulled out a comically large hammer made out of her own blood and brought it down towards Abel. He was surprised by the sudden attack. Did this girl have the same weapon producing powers as him? This just keeps getting more interesting. Tis the end, Abel! Power screamed as the hammer came down. You have once again been defeated by the mighty Power! Again, just to clarify, these two had never met each other. But it was already too late. Abel punched upwards his clenched fist colliding with the hammer. He hit it with such terrifying force that Power's blood hammer shattered against his knuckles. In that same instant, Abel noticed Denji running at him with an axe from behind. Abel produced another obsidian dagger and threw it into Denji's forehead, dropping him to the ground immediately. Pathetic. Power tried to produce another weapon, but she used up too much blood already. Before she had a chance to make anything substantial, Abel sprung forwards with terrifying speed trying to land a killing blow. But even weakened, Power was freakishly fast. She was able to dodge his blow and kick him in the ribs, momentarily stunning him. Of course, she took the time to gloat, putting her hands on her hips and laughing victoriously. Need a second to catch your breath, Abel. It is to be expected. None can keep up with me. She grandiously announced. Perhaps you should just give up and agree to become my servant. I might even teach you a thing or two about fighting. Suddenly, Abel was standing right in front of her, squeezing her throat with his iron grip. He smiled, flashing teeth, and said, If you want to kill, kill. Don't talk. With a surprisingly minimal amount of strength, he squeezed and heard a crunch from Power's neck. He dropped her limp body to the ground. Lucky for Power, Abel wasn't aware that a fiend like Power can survive an injury like this as long as she's fed some more blood. Instead, he just sighed in disappointment. Is that all you weaklings have to offer? He bellowed. Aki, barely conscious after being kicked against the wall, remained just conscious enough to activate his contract with a powerful beast known as the Fox Devil. He twists his hands into a strange gesture and whispers the word, Come, before falling unconscious. But that's still enough. Suddenly, a gigantic demonic fox claw bursts through the wall of the bar, spraying dust and rubble everywhere. Abel was definitely not expecting that. He dodged several times as the claw swiped for him, often barely missing him. For its last strike, it lunged forward and raked four claw marks across his chest. Abel was shocked by the sudden pain. It felt fantastic. He pulled a long obsidian spear out of one of his pocket dimensions and forced it down through the fox devil's paw and into the ground, pinning it in place. After a moment of thrashing, the claw dissipated into smoke, lending Abel another victory, though even he would admit this was a more exciting fight than the other ones had been. Was that it? Had he gained total victory once more just like he so often did these days? He was about to take pity on himself when Denji rose up behind him. 
How about a rematch? Denji asked. Abel grinned. He liked this kid. Challenge me, child. Abel said. Well, since you asked, Denji smirked. Denji reached into his shirt and grabbed the ripcord emerging from his chest. It was time to go into overdrive on this thing. He gave it a mighty yank, and like the rev of a chainsaw, the madness began. Denji transformed, giant blades emerging from his arms, and his head transformed into a toothy saw blade nightmare. He gave a mechanical roar that spewed smoke. This wasn't just Denji anymore. This was Chainsaw Man. Now this, Abel thought, feeling his adrenaline spike, is more like it. Following Denji's lead, Abel reached into one of his pocket dimensions and pulled out one of his favorite weapons, one he'd only previously used against the mighty hard-to-destroy reptile SCP-682, the Chainsaw Claymore. A huge two-handed sword with the eternally twisting, shredding teeth of a chainsaw ever circulating around it. It was time for Chainsaw vs. Chainsaw. What the hell are you waiting for? Chainsaw Man roared. Are we gonna stand around all day or are we gonna fight? Abel couldn't have said it better himself. The two charged at one another at lightning speeds, chainsaw clashing against chain sword. The sheer force of the contact was enough to send a shockwave blasting through the bar. It rapidly became a power struggle, each of them trying hard to force their chainsaws out of the stalemate. Realizing that this time he perhaps couldn't win with raw strength, Abel back flipped away to reassess his options. But Chainsaw Man had no intention of giving Abel time to think about it. He darted towards Abel with the weight and momentum of a runaway freight train. If Abel hadn't raised his claymore to parry, he would have been shredded to pieces by the devil's saws in an instant. Instead, the two of them rocketed out of the nearby wall in a cascade of debris, causing everyone on the outside street to run for their lives. The two quickly stood from the stumble. The two quickly stood up, catching their breath. Impressive, Abel said. You're much better than the others. Instead of replying, Denji briefly retracted his arm chainsaws and grabbed a nearby parked car, throwing it directly at Abel. Abel reacted quickly, cleaving the car in half with his claymore and charging for Chainsaw Man again. Just before Abel could land a lethal strike, Chainsaw Man deployed his chainsaws again, blocking the blow. Abel sped around him, trying to strike again and again, but Chainsaw Man blocked every strike with stunning efficacy. Abel was astonished. Few had ever been able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him like this before. He could feel his heart pounding gloriously in his chest. He would give Denji a warrior's death. With a furious yell, Abel brought down the Chainsaw Claymore for a devastating vertical strike, but Chainsaw Man was ready. He arranged his arm chainsaws in a cross formation like a giant pair of scissors and caught Abel's chainsword between them. Chainsaw Man pulled his arms in opposite directions, slicing Abel's mighty sword in half. The immortal swordsman skidded backwards to avoid the fallout, producing two smaller blades immediately. This Chainsaw Man just kept exceeding expectations, didn't he? Abel would need to change tactics if he wanted to win this one. Chainsaw Man was impressed by the speed and tenacity of his foe. For someone who apparently wasn't even a devil, Abel sure packed a hell of a punch. Did he ever run out of those damned weapons? As though attempting to answer Chainsaw Man's question for him, Abel began running around his flank, rapidly producing and throwing blades and axes in a startling volley. Chainsaw Man was able to use his chainsaw arms and face to block most of them, but not all of them. Several daggers and small throwing axes splattered into the tender flesh of Chainsaw Man's chest. Abel had successfully wounded him, and he wasn't done. Feeling a little more confident now, Abel decided to take a different tactic. He produced a large spiked mace from thin air and ran at Chainsaw Man while the devil was still recovering from his projectile attack. With one brutal whack, he sent Denji flying down the street, carving a rut into the concrete beneath him. But Abel wasn't done. While Chainsaw Man was still trying to recover, Abel leaped onto him and began beating him into the ground with his mace. The strikes were so brutal, they shook the earth and sent cracks across the surrounding ground. Then, Abel stopped. He realized, for a moment, that he was letting his bloodlust get the better of him. This was dishonorable. Where would be the fun in beating this boy to death while he lay on the ground and depriving himself of one of the greatest opponents he's had in quite some time? No, that would not do at all. He'd give him one more chance. On your feet, boy, Abel said. You fight well. Get up and carry on. I won't let a beast as rare as you die like a common dog. Rise and fight me. And Chainsaw Man did as he was told. 
Abel was shocked to see the very ground shatter underneath him as Chainsaw Man burst up through it, all his swords at the ready. The mace was thrown from Abel's hands as Chainsaw Man launched up towards him, all metal teeth and fury. Luckily for Abel, he pulled out a battle axe just in time to block the flurry of brutal strikes from the patron saint of chainsaws. Now this was a fight even Musashi would be proud of. Yes, boy, yes, Abel yelled. This is true combat. Chainsaw Man replied with the swing of his blades, which Abel was nearly able to dodge. The two finally landed back down on the ground, and Abel was fast enough to bury his battle axe in Chainsaw Man's shoulder. Before the devil could return a blow to Abel, the anomalous swordsman pulled out a pair of his favorite swords and locked Chainsaw Man's arms in place. Chainsaw Man was undeniably incredibly powerful, but it looked like Abel's superior experience and tactics might save him this time. What the hell are you? Chainsaw Man roared. You've been a worthy opponent, boy. Those are few and far between, Abel said. I'll remember you for this. But before Abel could execute a killing blow, he felt a blood-red throwing axe stick into his back. Abel winced in pain to see Power and Aki about 30 feet behind him. Power was propping Aki up. He donated some of his blood to bring her back to life, and she was just as delusionally cocky as ever. Abel was about to say something, but he already made a fatal mistake, letting his guard down. Before another word could pass the cursed warrior's lips, one of Chainsaw Man's arm chainsaws passed directly through his heart, tearing it apart within Abel's chest. It was a sudden and decisive killing blow. Chainsaw Man pulled his saw back out of Abel's chest, stained with the deadly anomaly's blood. Abel collapsed to the ground, wheezing and bleeding profusely from the hole in his chest. But strangely, as Power, Aki, and Chainsaw Man converged around him, they realized he was smiling. Thank you, Abel said, and died yet again. With the battle won, like an incredible hulk made of metal, Chainsaw Man transformed back into Denji. The trio stood around Abel's corpse, deeply confused as to what had just happened. If this was the kind of thing the SCP Foundation normally dealt with, they all silently agreed that perhaps it would be better not to get involved with them in the future. Except Power, of course, who said, You two should be thanking me for defeating him. You both owe me drinks for this. Hundreds of miles away in a black sarcophagus deep underwater, surrounded by professional SCP Foundation divers, Abel's body once again returned. Who knows how long he'd remain sleeping in there. But what we do know is that his deathless sleep was suffused with the sweet dreams, knowing that this world still held worthy opponents. And for Abel, that was everything. Now go check out Could SCP-682 Be Contained in the Backrooms and SCP-096 vs. Siren Head for more deranged out-of-universe crossovers from the SCP Foundation.